I am fascinated by counterfactuals, especially when it comes to our personal lives. You tweak some tiny detail in your own life and you go in a completely different direction, you become a completely different person. And at the time, one usually doesn't know what the important moments are. My guest today did an MBA in finance and worked as a bond trader, and she also loved music. And at one point in her life, she decided to quit her career and study music and become a musician. Later, after a couple of albums, touring with a backup band she wasn't quite comfortable with. She was in a groove where she says she might well have quit at some point. But then she fell in love with a guitarist from another country, married him, and her music also fell into place as they began to collaborate and it reached new heights. And there are other parts here. And there are other lives that were possible. She could have stayed in finance and become successful there. She could have fallen in love with some other man and married him and had kids and all the conventional stuff. She may not have met the music teacher she did meet who inspired her and taught her so much. She may not have got the opportunities she got. Luckily for us, it worked out this way when she chose her passion. But so many others stay on the conventional route and their art is unseen. So many others choose their passion, fail and their sadness is unseen. Having said that, when you feel a love this strong as Kiran Aluwalia felt for her music, you plunge yourself into it. To embrace your true self can be hard, but it is the best form of self-love. And if we can't love ourselves, we are nothing. Welcome to The Seen and the Unseen, our weekly podcast on economics, politics and behavioral science. Please welcome your host, Amit Varma. Welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. My guest today is a musician, singer, composer, lyricist Kiran Aluwalia, whose work spans genres and has touched people across the world. She left a promising career in finance to follow her heart and study music and become a musician. I will list all her albums in the show notes. I urge you to discover her music and go with her through her musical journey. My favorite album of hers still recently was Arm Zameen or Common Ground, a collaboration with Tenari Wen and Terra Kaft, the legendary Tuareg blues bands from Africa. But actually, my new favorite now is Comfort Food, her yet-to-be-released album. In fact, this episode is a world premiere for some of the songs from this new album and there'll be a lot of music here. So if you listen at higher speeds, please slow down to normal speed when the songs happen. A few happen during during the episode and I've put a bunch at the end that she wanted to share with my listeners. I'll give a listing with time codes in the show notes. But as much as the music, I love this conversation and I especially loved the bit about her charming romance with Reza Bazi, the Pakistan-born American guitarist whom she married and who's played on all her albums since they met. Lovely story, great music. I'll cherish this conversation. But before we get to it, let's take a quick commercial break. Have you always wanted to be a writer but never quite gotten down to it? Well, I'd love to help you. Since April 2020, I've enjoyed teaching 27 cohorts of my online course, The Art of Clear Writing, and an online community has now sprung up of all my past students. We have workshops, a newsletter to showcase the work of students, and vibrant community interaction. In the course itself, through four webinars spread over four weekends, I share all I know about the craft and practice of clear writing. There are many exercises, much interaction, and a lovely and lively community at the end of it. The course costs rupees 10,000 plus GST or about $150. If you're interested, head on over to register at indiauncut.com slash clear writing. That's indiauncut.com slash clear writing. Being a good writer doesn't require God-given talent, just a willingness to work hard and a clear idea of what you need to do to refine your skills. I can help you. Kiran, welcome to The Scene and the Unseen. Thank you, Amit. It's Absolutely amazing to be here because I'm a fan of you and of your podcast. And I've pretty much listened to maybe like the last 100 episodes that you've done. And a couple of them time and time over, like I've repeated this. I've, I've, repeat, I've listened to them a number of times on repeat. So I can't believe I made it here. Thanks for having me. You know, it's absolutely my pleasure. And I must say, I'm late to discovering your music. But now that I've discovered it and spent some time sort of listening to it, I think in the end, my count of listening to your songs will be way, 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 way more than you are listening to my episodes. Aww. But thank you for the kind words. I want to sort of start by asking a broad question. Like you've been kind enough to share the songs of your latest album with me. And... I was kind of blown away and I heard them after listening to the rest of your music and and it just feels so incredibly 
powerful and you know i mean i don't want to compare any of your work with any of your other work that's obviously not fair but i i, mean, I, I, I just felt that this is you know the, the, there's sort of a clear evolution and this is so powerful and so good and i'm wondering how you feel about the journey that you made in music because typically what happens in music is that unlike the other arts music is considered a young person's game you get in there in your 20s and you're doing stuff and a lot of the rock icons like 27 is a famous age when a lot of rock icons died like jimi hendrix jim morrison janis joplin and so on and so forth 33 bunch of people died at 33 as well these are like two iconic uh, sort of ages in rock to die and it's always you know you'd rather burn out than fade away is what seems to happen in a lot of uh, typically in music whereas in the other arts you have writers and painters and so on reach maturity over time that it is not really a young man's game you know you you're playing a kind of long game it's very common with a uh, uh, artists and authors that they'll really hit their stride in the 30s or 40s or even 50s and which gives me hope because i'm kind of late to that game but tell me about how you think about the journey of a musician like i'm guessing when you started in the 90s them and we'll talk about your entire journey and how you made that shift and it's all fascinating to me and we'll dig deep into that but just you know in a general sense when you started you must have started with this exuberance and the passion of youth and and then the years pass and sometimes i think at some point in your life maybe you look back and you're like what the fuck happened where did those decades go you know and all your dreams change over time i'm guessing and i'm almost speaking in an autobiographical way because that's how it is a year just pass your dreams change you realize that maybe you aimed for the wrong things maybe some of the things you aim for aren't happening maybe the process is more important than a particular goal of something and you know you're 57 you've brought out this incredible powerful album which is which speaks to the time you know which is so moving in different ways what is your sense of you know the journey that you made and how you've sort of redefined it for yourself well i mean first of all i don't mind you comparing my new stuff to my older stuff that's i you know i do it and i love that i'm talking to a person who has the ability to understand my music and compare it because uh although i was born in patna bihar very early on we left india and so i've been outside of india my whole life even though i've come back to india to study so but my point is that in my career most of my interviews like 99% of my interviews are with non indian non hindi speaking or urdu speaking or hindustani speaking people and so they don't often understand the words of my songs and they don't understand the trajectory as much world music enthusiasts and uh people who know world music will understand the trajectory but but a lot of people don't so i love that you are someone who you know you're able to compare it and then uh look at the differences so oh what was the question how do i feel about my journey was it i forgot the question sorry yeah it, it, it's how you feel about your journey and how you sort of redefined it like uh. when you're young you want something different when you're older you want something different you know sitting now where you are when you look back yeah yeah so yeah you're right about that for me definitely the journey is what it's all about and then everything that i get on the way is just a bonus but even in the beginning i knew that i would just be lucky to be able to get up in the morning and be able to sing like do my riyaz and do my music and you know like being an indian person growing up in canada and singing and compo- composing and singing in urdu hindi punjabi i never even could dream that i could make a career out of what i'm doing i always thought that okay i'm going to get my mba in finance like i did and uh i'm going to do other stuff and then i'm going to have this passion of music and i'm going to do it on the side but by luck 
I put out an album. By luck, I was at the right place at the right time. I got a manager. I got an agent. Lo and behold, I started to get tours. Um, and people started to buy my, my music in Canada. And so I thought, okay, I'll, I'll see where this takes me. I'll do this for a year and then I'll come back to doing a full time job. But that year has lasted for 23 years now. And so for me, I'm just so incredibly lucky that I, that I got to do this. I got to wake up. I got to do music every day. I got to compose. I, I got to release my emotions and say what I need to say through music. So, so yeah, I'm happy with the journey. You know, you mentioned about how part of the journey that you're happy with is that you get to wake up in the morning and you get to write music and you get to, you know, spend time doing what you really love. And I sort of, like, I wonder how you manage the balance between that just that primal impulse of immersing yourself in music, creating stuff and all of that with all the other things that come with being a quote-unquote a musician right in the sense that I would imagine that in different ways there are all kinds of constraints that you know by default end up shaping you and I don't necessarily mean constraints in a bad way constraints are perhaps inevitable but like one kind of constraint which you have shrugged aside magnificently is of course a constraint of genre where you know you're thinking beyond those typical boxes that people think in that yeah sure you've done the guzzle but you've done so many different kinds of forays into different kinds of music and just created something that is your own and and that you've gone past and that's great but then there's also in a sense a constraint of form that the music industry expects songs that are a particular length or expects them released in particular formats and albums have to have a certain number of songs and all these are really artifacts of an earlier age you know the three minute song evolved because at the turn of the 20th century that's how much you'd fit on those small discs then the long playing record came and then that convention became 40 minutes so an album would have 12 songs or whatever and all of these conventions are artifacts of constraints that no longer exist that today we can just do whatever we can stretch out we can do something that's just a 30 second a moment of magic or an half an hour performance and and you do see many of those in, in uh, live and on youtube and all that and that's one kind of constraint and i guess another kind of constraint would be the constraint of expectations that once you embark upon a career, people will look upon you as a particular kind of music, like, oh, she does fusion, which, you know, you have an 18 year old interview where you talk about why you don't like uh, uh, that word, but they expect a certain kind of music from you. And, and that can subconsciously, if anything, you know, push you in that, push you further in that direction. Or maybe, you know, something I, uh, you know, discuss with my uh, friend Gaurav in whose studio we're recording about how you know, every song that you bring out is really an artifact of you at a particular point in time. It is a snapshot. It is a static snapshot. But a photograph is not a person. But then your audiences would then expect you every time you're, you know, they'd expect you to perform some favorites and they'd look at you through the prism of the music of yours they've heard and therefore the picture that they formed of you as a person but you are much more complex you're always evolving and i how do you deal with these sort of internal things and of course there are the much cruder sort of constraints like the promotional stuff you might have to do the music videos that you might uh, you know have to bring out with uh, with the song like i watched the hayat video which is very interesting but and the video is beautiful the song is amazing I didn't feel like they went together, you know, that, you know, when you're sort of the, the, the groove of the song is just, you know, I, I don't think the uh, video kind of captures it, but it's stuff you have to do. It's promotional stuff and you have to get out there and sort of do it. So what are the different kinds of things that you find yourself balancing in terms of form, in terms of expectations, in terms of what the music business expects from you, what your fans expect from you, you know? Is there a real you behind all of this that, you know, is kind of unseen? Well, in terms of form, uh, there's definitely a real me. And I, I hope I'm real all the time when I'm on stage, when I'm in interviews and uh, when I'm composing. I, I definitely want my music to be a reflection of me, uh, whatever I am. And uh, I think I do, a you know, a, a pretty good job I mean, i'm happy with 
how my music turns out. I think it does reflect me. As you said, you know, each song represents the current evolution of what I happen to be at that moment. So in terms of form, yeah, I started out, my first album was released in 2000. And at that time, I was a very young composer. And I composed two things on that album. And the rest were uh, there were a, a few compositions of my Guruji, my, my Ghazal Guruji Vithal Rao, and uh, there were a couple of other maybe like uh, Punjabi folk songs that are public domain. And then after that first album, and it was mostly Ghazal and it was mostly traditional. And then after that album, I I discovered a group of poets in Canada. And they were mainly all Pakistani, Pakistani-Canadian poets. And they were writing Urdu Ghazal in Canada. And so for the first time, I didn't have to look towards India to get material to compose. So my first album was Kashish Attraction. And then for my second album, which I called Beyond Boundaries, I took the words of these Canadian Pakistani poets and composed them. And they were also ghazal. They were writing in the ghazal and the nazam format. And I composed that. And then after that, God, I kind of forget what my third album was. Uh, uh, that was your eponymous album for Kiran Alawali. Oh, that's right. That was my first album that was released internationally. The first two were just in Canada. And then my self-titled album was released internationally. And it was a combination of of uh, songs, a compilation of songs from my first two albums. And so what happened there is that I didn't have an album, but I got a record deal. <laughs> and it was a record deal from Tri Triloka Records in, in the States, in the United States, to, you know, have international distribution. So I told them that I can't get you an album, you know, this fast. But what we can do is we can take a few songs from each of those albums that each of my previous two albums that have not been released yet internationally. And I'll give you a couple, like two more new songs. And they said, OK, we'll do that. So for those two songs that I was now going to put on that self-titled album, I wanted to do something different. So I thought I would do a collaboration with a Celtic Canadian fiddler named Natalie McMaster. And so because I wanted to collaborate with her, the guzzle format and the Punjabi folk song format wasn't wasn't well the Punjabi folk song format she could fit in but the guzzle format wasn't quite fitting in the type of collaboration that I wanted to do with her so then I took some words and I, I went outside the guzzle format and I composed them in a different way especially for her so that she could shine I could compose something in which she could shine and I could really take the like the the, the true ras, you know, the true essence of her, of what she does well. So that's how I started branching out. Then after that, in my fourth album, which was Wanderlust, by that time, I had discovered two types of music. One was Portuguese fado music, which to me is the Portuguese ghazal, because it's the Portuguese music of longing. And uh, really fell in love with it. And uh, we were we were touring in Portugal with my husband's band, uh, my husband Reza Bassi, who's a guitarist. We were touring there with his band. And we were there for a month. And so I ended up spending a week and recording with Portuguese Fado musicians. And that worked out with the ghazal format. So I recorded like ghazal with them. But at the same time, I also fell deeply, madly, insanely in love with Tuareg music. Now, Tuaregs are a nomadic people from the Sahara Desert. And so the boundaries are man-made, and the way that the boundaries are made, the Tuareg people's home now falls in between present-day Mali and present-day Algeria. And these are nomadic people from the Sahara, and they're the indigenous people of that area. 
And the seminal supergroup of this genre of music is Tenari Wen. And I was in Toronto and we had a day off. We were actually recording the fourth album and uh, in studio and we had a day off. So um, I thought, oh, let's go listen to some music tonight. And I picked a Fado concert to go to, a Portuguese Fado concert to go to, and Rez and I went. And uh, after half of it, I thought, okay, like, you know, this is cool. But I also knew Tenari One was playing somewhere else. And so th for the rest, for the second half, I went to see Tenari One and just absolutely, like, like loved it. And so... I didn't think I would do anything with it because in my mind, I had just come back from Portugal and Portuguese father was in my mind. So I loved Tenari One, but had no plans to do anything with it. But the next day I woke up with the sounds of Tenari One in my head. The day after I woke up with their sounds in my head and humming their songs. The day after I went out and bought a CD of theirs and started listening to it on repeat. <laughs> So I thought, okay, I'm like, there's something here for me. I'm really connecting with this. And I connected it, I connected to that music in a way that my tabla player, Nitin Mitta, uh, who's originally from Hyderabad, he thinks that in my previous life, I was probably a Tuareg. And members of Tenariwen think that too. <laughs> So I really connected with it. So for me, when I fall in love with a type of music, be it Portuguese fado or Celtic fiddle or, or, or Tuareg music, I want to own it. I want to possess it. I want it to be, you know, like that two-year-old. I become that two-year-old person and I want to say the word mine. Mm -hmm. Like this is mine. And so I wanted to make it mine and I wanted to in incorporate those ideas in my music. Still wasn't thinking that I would ever get to collaborate with Tenari One because they were already a super group. They had already opened up and toured with the Rolling Stones. So they were like, you know, the bad boys of rock and roll and world music. So when I sat down to try and compose something with ideas that came from Tuareg music, it didn't work with Ghazal. So I thought, okay, how am I going to do this? So then at that time, I took a 16th century ghazal written by Qutub Kuli Shah, who lived in the Dakhni region, who was, who was the, the, the royalty, the king of the Dakhni region, which is now Hyderabad. And so his words, I felt that I could have more artistic license with, and I didn't have to follow the ghazal format while composing it, and I could do my own stuff with it. And then it was the first time I got Rez to play electric guitar with, so then I branched out in that way with it. So then after that, after that fourth album was uh, was recorded, and that that song that I did with the influence of 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 Tenariwan and Tuareg music was called Tere Darsan, and it sounds like it's a religious song, like Tere Darsan ki hume saimati, but it's not. It's about love and someone you know waiting to meet their beloved. So that was the fourth album. Then after that. Uh, by this time, I'd done a lot of collaborations, and each collaboration was a succinct project. Like, I collaborated with Celtic Fiddle. That was done, you know, put it out there, moved on. Did uh, Collaborated with Portuguese Fado. I got it out of my system. It was done, loved it. What else is there in the world? But when I, when I got into Tuareg music, that music hasn't left me. It's now become a permanent way that influences my music. And so from then on, I have been in, I've been doing even my own music with Tuareg music, with the influence of Tuareg music. So then what happened after I did Tere Darsan and I put it on my fourth album called Wanderlust, uh, Wanderlust received the, the UK's uh, Best Newcomer Award from Songlines magazine. So in order to accept that award, I went to Copenhagen and 
in Denmark, and there I met the producer of Tenari One's first three albums. And I met him and I just told him, oh my God, I love your stuff. I love the way you produce them. It's so amazing. And then I told him that I have been composing with their influence. And he said, send me what you did. So I went back to, I was now living in New York City by this time, went back home to New York City and sent him my stuff. And he said, why don't you do something with them? And so that's how I ended up doing something with Tenariwen and also another Tuareg group called Terracaft. And then out came my fifth album, which I called Am Zameen, Common Ground. And that is, that's like a, a nod to the fact that even though they're in Africa and I'm an Indian living in New York City, we were able to find common ground. So basically, to get back to your question, which is, you know, how th that's basically the story of how I I have not stuck to I, 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 I evolved out of the guzzle form. I should actually finish it by saying, so a guzzle was not going to work with the Tenario and kind of music. So again, I had to find different things to compose. And so I first composed the song Rabaru, which is written in a specifically Delhi dialect. Of, of Hindi, meri mannat rakhyo, like that word, rabba meri mannat rakhyo, that word rakhyo is very, very dilly. So I first composed that to do with Tenariwan, but turn of events, I ended up doing that with Terakaft. Uh, and then um, with Tenariwan, I ended up doing something more iconic, which is the Kavali Must Must, which was made famous in the West and actually all over by Nusrat Fateli Khan. So I wanted to do something more iconic with them. But basically, I started composing out of the guzzle genre because my own influence of this Tuareg music and wanting to do electric guitar and wanting to now have drum kit in my music, it wasn't, uh, the guzzle format wasn't going to going to allow me to incorporate all these influences and that necessity is what me what made me leave the guzzle form and come into a basically song a normal song format what we would call in india in indian uh, music geet but what we would call in the west is just a song a song format now what you had, what you had asked is uh, how have my uh, how has my audience reacted to that there have only been a couple of people that I can recall that have missed the guzzle format. One is the editor of the Songlines magazine, Simon Broughton. Um, he he mentioned to me once or twice that he misses the guzzle, my guzzle forms. And then maybe like there's like some like random person, a fan at the end of a concert who said it. But basically, the audience has has made the journey with me. So they've they've come with me on the journey. I haven't received any pushback. And my career has grown. My audience has grown, actually, since the first album. So, so it's, it's all been good. Like, there's, you know, there's no reason for me to say that, oh, I, I did something wrong here. I'm happy with it. My audience seems to be happy with it. So that's all good. Now, there was a second part of your um, question, which was, other parts of constraints, other constraints in my life other than music. And that's a really interesting question. And you're right, there are other things. I can't focus in this day and age being an independent musician because I'm not doing Bollywood. I'm an independent musician. I cannot focus 100% on the music. So I do my three hours of riyaz every day. Uh, you know, sometimes it's a little less. Riyaz and composing a day. But then the other part of my day is spent on administration, answering a lot of emails from my manager, from my agents, from my, my band members of uh, administering uh, future tours and what's going to happen and you know, what gigs I'm going to ex accept and whatnot, then doing all the marketing, answering your, your PR related uh, inquiries, you know, making with the help of your publicist, a press release, all the PR related things, doing videos, there's all that. But for me, I actually love that I can have that division in my brain. Because what happens to me, the way I'm built, is that 
when I do a lot of music, the music utilizes a separate part of my brain. And it utilizes the part of my brain that is more sensitive, that is accessing my emotions more because I'm trying to take an emotion that I'm feeling and translate that into song, into melody, into rhythm, and and into lyrics. And when this part of my brain is used too much, then I develop an oversensitivity to what's happening in the world. And then I start breaking down. (laughs) So what happens is if I'm on tour and I'm like doing just like, you know, someone like other people are managing the administration and all I have to think about is the music and I'm on this like two, three week tour, what starts to happen is that I'll hear some news. Like I was in Canada when I was doing the release actually of Am Zameen Common Ground 2011 and we were about to do the um, CD release concert in Toronto to like 1,200 people. And the night before, I happened to hear news. It was it was a really, really cold winter. And I heard on the news that a woman who had Alzheimer's left her home and couldn't find her home again. And she was knocking on people's doors. But it was late at night, so no one was opening the door to her. And she was out in the freezing cold. Uh, Like, I forget what it was, but like, you know, like, I don't know, negative 30 degrees Celsius or something like that. It was really, really cold. And she froze to death. And so because that part of my brain that is super, super sensitive when I'm, when I'm, when I'm accessing to do music, what kept in, kept on happening is that I kept on repeat, that story kept on repeating in my mind. And I kept on imagining that woman rolling on this neighbor's or whatever, this, this other person's driveway in the ice and dying. And I could not shake it. I could not get out of it. And so that distracts me then because I have to go on stage. I cannot in the middle of song if I have that, that, that image coming to me and it will come, come to me. I have to work extra hard to get that image out and come back to the song and focus on the song and focus, focus on the now. And I'm here with my band and right now I'm doing this song. And right now there are 1200 people here who, who want to enjoy the song with me. So for me, someone like me, I really like it when I, I, I don't have to spend 100% of my time uh, accessing that part of my brain. And it really makes me feel better when I can access the other part of my brain where I do administrative work. And uh, I'm a very visual person as well. And I love working on my videos. I actually loved the Hayat video. I personally, I'm, I'm totally like uh, open to receiving other person's interpretations of what they feel about it but personally I really love it I love the crew um and it was a really amazing experience for me to do it happy with it but I I really you know it's never a burden for me to do the videos I love doing the videos and it's never a burden to do the marketing I, I just I love every aspect of of what I have to do yeah I mean I really like the video as well but it's just, I think what happens is that I heard the song first and I heard it a few times first and then I saw the video. And the, the the video kind of fixes the way you think of the song if you watch it first because then every time you hear the song, you're seeing the visuals in your head. And, it's true. And, and for me, because I heard the song first and, you know, so it's it's not a criticism of the video per se. That's, you know, that, that, that that's part of, uh, you know, what one does, but just... You get what I mean? And, I do. And it's it's a, sort of, you know, what I kind of loved about your journey and it comes through in uh, all the albums as well is how organic it is in the sense of, you know, you're being true to yourself. And and, and what I loved about Am Zameen was that there is not, like, it, it, it just feels like it is one thing. There is no contrivance in it. I never felt while listening to it that I'm listening to different people coming together for a project, right? It just felt very organic and very together and 
and it's almost like there are like three things going on there in the sense there is you with your sensibilities this scenario when and there's also rez and he's doing his guitar thing and that's also a very interesting kind of vibe which you know continues through your other albums and and i just felt that it all made sense like even when uh, you know you perform their song mata jam it just it sounded like your song thank you right and and that that was just great and you know since you've very kindly pointed out that you have the copyright to your songs and <laughs> we can actually play them you mentioned rabbaru i just really love that massive earworm potential along with other songs on the album which i like so let's play a little bit of rabbaru for the listeners for sure Me 
So here's sort of my next question about and 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 we'll get to chronology and I'm very fascinated about your entire journey and all the steps you took but I'm also struck by you know while you were speaking I remembered this fantastic quote which um, uh, I I I first heard in my episode with Amitabh Kumar and it's a quote on writing where he quoted William Maxwell a, a great editor and writer and Maxwell once told him that after 40 years what I have come to care about is not style but the breath of life right and and that really struck me the breath of life that that's really what matters and everything else you can kind of manage you can learn the craft you can master the craft you can do the doing but it it starts with that moment of inspiration where you can't maybe get a so- sound out of your head and you know there's something going on in there and then later then comes two processes almost and one is a process of actually sitting down and turning it into a song a song with structure and format and you know and that's a whole craft and all of that and then there is even that third process where you point out that you're on stage with your band and things could be going wrong maybe the monitors aren't working too well or somebody just broke a string or whatever but you're performing you you're going through those motions you know and at one level it might seem kind of a mundane thing to do the thousandth time you're playing a song but at another level that's also the game just you know i'm in in my recent episode with jerry pinto he told me a story which resonated with many many people and it is about abe faria who centuries ago was a portuguese priest and at uh, and a young portuguese priest and his dad was also a, a priest and his dad joined the priesthood after having him so but his dad was also a priest and at one point abe faria and his dad get called to i think the vatican Uh, where they have to speak and it is an incredible honor and the pope is there and everybody and for abe faria this young priest to preach before them uh, is such an incredible opportunity and he's so good at this because he's done it so often but then he goes up on stage and he completely freezes and nothing is coming into his head because the occasion is too huge like the freaking pope is sitting right there <laughs> and then his father whispers to him hisses at him from from below katur re bhaji katur re bhaji and katur re bhaji means cut the vegetables mm. you know and that and 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 that is so striking because from the outside when we look at artists we think it is an almost mystical thing that is happening but a lot of it is you're cutting the vegetables you're doing the thing and it seems to me that part of your art is that initial mystical thing the breath of life and then there is a hard work of crafting it into a song or into a performance and doing the arrangements and saying ki nahi yahan pe drums is point pe aayega and all of that mm-hmm. and then there is the, there are the iterations and the performances with each one perhaps different from the other mm-hmm. but you are doing katur re bhaji katur re bhaji cut the vegetables so tell me a, 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 a little bit about how these musical processes and you know how you go through all of these has evolved for you for you because i imagine when you would have been very young you know the breath of life would always have been powerful that you have that tune in your head or the words you know come together in a certain way and it's incredibly inspiring but you're still kind of learning the craft you're still sort of figuring out what your voice is and all of those things and but over time it just becomes you know so automatic that you know the mastery seems instant at least from the outside you know like take take to take me through that process of how a musician comes up with their music and how they refine it and just that whole process of all of these aspects right so how like the i'm, I'm interested in this katur re bhaji thing do so to me when you tell that story I thought about when people freeze and you know they say imagine the audience in their underwear. So, uh-huh. <laughs> have you heard of that? No, I first time. Oh, yet. okay, okay. So that's, you know, you imagine the audience in your underwear so that you're not intimidated by them anymore. And I guess to me when you relate the story of Katur Rabhaji is the same thing that he's telling his son that you're not performing, you're just in your kitchen cutting the vegetables. So, like to, to to me when i'm singing on stage it's never mundane for me when i'm doing my riyaz in my own apartment all alone then it's definitely mundane and sometimes i just want to get up and you know do other things if it's a nice day i want to go out in the sun 
But, you know, that's when the discipline comes in and I've just got to sit there and I've got to do this. But when I'm on stage, it's never mundane for me. And for people who haven't seen me perform live, I do get into a trance. I don't do, you know, ghazal anymore. I'm doing a type of a music that is inspired by trance, that is inspired by Tuareg trance. And so the way I move around, um, you know, I shake my head, my hair goes flying everywhere, I get into a trance. And I, I or at least I, I let go. I definitely, you know, let go. And I want to do that. I want to let go because I want to enjoy that moment myself. And I want to let my body move and my voice move as freely as possible. And be because for the last 15 years of the people I have in my group, first of all, Reza Bossi, this monster guitarist who I happen to be, in love with <laughs> my husband he's right there you know on the right right of me then there's my tabla players you know Nitin Mitta Ravi Naimpali people that I trust that I have played with for you know over a decade uh and my you know accordion player my 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 drum kit player my bassist when I started out I I wasn't friends with my band members I didn't even get along with one of them and it was really tense um and I really felt like I was all alone on stage but 2 or 3 years into my touring career I developed a really great band that I've been with ever since and so I feel like they have my back if something goes wrong they're going to have my back we're going to we're going to deal with it together if i missed a beat here if i did an extra bar here someone's going to figure it out and we're going to get right back on track and we're going to make it musical so a lot of the worry that was in that was on that i had on stage in the first 3 years of my touring left me because i had this amazing back that uh, i had this amazing band that i trust and we'll do it together and so once that worry's gone i can let go and enjoy myself and also when things become second nature to me like i love that too like i love that this song is going to come out of me no matter what um no matter what kind of news i was just texted before i got on stage uh, I'm going to get up on stage and no ma matter what, I've done this song so many times, it's just going to come out of me. I just love that because that helps me to relax and it helps me to perform the song and it helps me to go deeper into the song. If I don't have to focus that much on the rhythm, if I don't have to focus that much on the pitch. Um, at the same time, it's really important to keep on doing new songs because they're the ones that make you you know they kick your ass you 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 did it in, in rehearsal and you might have done it in studio but now you're doing it in front of a people of in front of people and doing a new song kicks your ass and it's it's really important to have that adrenaline like oh my god is it going to work is it going to be like a train accident how is it going to go so it's important to have that too but when i do a new song i definitely move less because I'm concentrating more on the rhythm and what, what the band is doing. Because I, I need to make sure more that it doesn't, it's not a train wreck. So that's how that is. And then you said, what was the second part of your question? It wasn't even a coherent question, so I apologize for that. I was kind of thinking aloud. But it's more about that journey that a song or a piece of music may make from just being that quasi mystical thought in your head that breath of life and then you use all of your craft to kind of make it into something coherent and then when you're doing katur re bhaji in a sense on the stage performing it a thousand times it just be it, it almost in a sense you the way you're describing it would seem to take a life of its own where you can just go into a trance and the song plays itself yeah, like I'm not doing Kato Rabhaji because to me at this point in my career, I've been touring regularly for 23 years. I've done my cutting in the vegetables uh, in the kitchen and I'm really enjoying the fact that I'm in front of an audience. Uh, I'm grateful 
to be in front of an audience. I'm, I'm doing independent world music in a foreign land. I'm really grateful that all these people put down some money to come and see me. In their underwear. <laughs> exactly, in their underwear. And so I'm getting a high from it. I, I'm I'm taking the music to another level for me and I'm getting a high from it and I'm being inspired by it. So I really love being in that moment of connecting with the audience. I, re- I really love connecting with the audience and I've been told I'm really good at it. Like I'll talk in my audience, with my audience. And I also like, you know, like I, I watch a lot of stand-up comedy, and I love the fact that stand-up comedy is now becoming popular, has been popular in India for the last, I don't know, 10 years. And now with social media and, you know, YouTube, it's accessible to me, even if I'm in New York City. And so I watch a lot of stand-up comedy, and if something happened, you know, on the way to the gig, I'll do it in a stand-up comedy style, and I'll, want, I'll you know, I'll make the audience laugh, and I love all of that. Um, or, you know, one of my band members will say something and we'll have a banter and we love that. So to me, I don't want to do the Kato Rubaji because I'm, I'm completely comfortable with being in front of the audience. In fact, I thrive on it. I love it. It's the thing I do. It's my mojo. And see, there you go. Now, I forgot the answer again. But you said, okay, so how does a song become a song kind of a thing, right? Is that That's the kind of like, I think, the essence of your question, right? It's one of the areas, but I love your answer anyway, because it doesn't matter where it goes. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what I got out of the question is, how does a song become a song? So um, that's, that's so super hard to articulate, right? So always so hard to articulate your process. But in a song for me becomes a song in so many different ways. One way is that, you know, I live with my guitarist and my arranger, Reza Bassi. So we'll be watching TV and he'll be noodling on his guitar and then he'll do something and then I'll, and I'll love it. And so I'll just put it on my iPhone. I'll say, can you record that? Can you play it again? And I'll record it. So I have numerous such recordings and I'll come back to them and I'll want to incorporate and I'll, and I'll, and I'll uh, compose something based on that guitar riff. That's one way. Something will happen in the world that will affect me and uh, I'll be touched by it in a, either a great way or, or a horrible way. And I will want to write about it. So, for example, in my last album, Seven Billion, there is a song called Sat. And that's a song about the seven billion of us on the planet today and it's about cultural intolerance amongst the seven billion of us on the planet today and it's talking about uh, the song is inspired by how there's all this fighting like people are fighting the religions are fighting uh, amongst themselves that no this religion is the best and then even within a religion there are sects of people fighting saying no no This is the best way to do this and not that way. And so what the song is saying, there's 7 billion billion people in this world and there's 7 billion different ways of doing things. There's no one right way. So that that song happened because I wanted to write about cultural intolerance. Uh, In the new album uh, that is going to come out in September 2023, there's a song that I wrote called Jane Jahan. And that song I specifically wrote about about really the marginalization of Muslims in India today. And I was inspired to write a song of political resistance, um, a protest song by Hussein Hadri, who is a wonderful Urdu poet who I discovered, and then I actually discovered your podcast, Amit, uh, through him, because you interviewed him, and that's how I discovered your podcast and became quickly a fan of your podcast. 
So at that time, um, I discovered Hussain Hadri because um, he had written uh, this nazm called Tum De Koge, uh, based on Faz Ahmed Faz's The Mean Hum De Kenge. So he wrote this. It's a, it's a political protest song against uh, about Muslim marginalization in India. And I was I study I was just studying this nazm in a deeper way just because I wanted to do it with my friend Krupa Sandila, who's a professor in Amherst, Amherst University in Massachusetts. So we were the, we were just studying this poem, and then and tra- and she was translating it in English, and I was just you know being her typist as she was translating it, and uh, I couldn't get the poem out of my mind. And I started humming a tune to it, and Rez was in the kitchen, and he said, "Oh, that sounds nice." So I started making a melody for this nazam tum de koge. And I composed it as a song. Then I got in touch with Hussain Hadri, got his permission. And so uh, I recorded that song for this album. But then I was also inspired by Hussain to write my own song about about this topic. And so I write, wrote Jani Jahan about, about, uh, about this. And what I'm saying in that song is that um, I'm saying, basically what I'm trying to say is that if you cut us... We all bleed, and and that blood is the exact same shade of red. And when we cry, we all have the same taste of that same salt in our tears. And we're the same, you know, no matter what people are saying that we're divided by religion. People aren't seeing that we're actually the same. And so that's my message in that song. So that's one way that songs come about. A third way that songs come about is that a melody just comes into my head. Uh, a song I wrote uh, for the album. Uh, which album? And I think you mentioned it, about you. You mentioned Khafa in Sonata, which came about like that. Right. Okay. Khafa is a good one. So Khafa came about because a melody came into my head first. So the the one way is that Rez does something and I want to incorporate that and I, I do it that way. Another way is that I want to say something about the world and I write the lyrics first and then and then do the arrangement later. And then a third way is that the, the melody itself arrives in my head. And so the the, the, the melody for Khafa uh, came into my head and I don't even remember what I was singing, but but I'm, I'll, I'll be singing garbage words that don't mean anything. But I, I like, you know, I've got this melody. I want to hang on to it. I don't have the words. So I'll just sing some garbage words and, and fall to words and I'll record it. So I have the melody. And then I'll, I'll sit down and I'll think about either does something naturally come to me to write about in this melody or I'll, I'll think about it intellectually. Like, what do I want to write about? What am I, what am I thinking right now? And so Khafa at that time uh, became a song about writing, writing about uh, religious fundamentalism and my anger against people who think they own religion and they think that the way to the spirit a spiritual leader, if you want to call them God, a spiritual a spirit, they think that the you know the way to that person is through them or through a specific way, and they kind of get in the way of a direct relationship with God. So there you go. Those are some of the ways that that a song becomes a song. <laughs> I also want to talk about you know the angle you mentioned of the way that you connect with your audiences and the way they connect with you that you know you go to a concert and everything just falls into its own groove like that and you can talk about what happened that morning or whatever and there's that instant connection and it strikes me that you know that one aspect of an artist's relationship with her listeners which i have only really come to notice in the last few years is is intimacy right because some people are, in a sense, broadcasting to millions of people. They're larger than lives. You know, you'll have film stars in India for whom temples were made in the 80s and the 70s and whatever. And they're just completely larger than life. And then there are other people, especially in the modern age with what technology allows you to do. There are other people with whom the connection you feel is much more intimate, so much so that you feel like you know them. Right. And I get this a lot from people who listen to my podcast where they'll come up to me at an airport or whatever and keeps happening all the time. And they'll talk to me like they know me. And I welcome that. It's beautiful. You know, I had someone listen to an episode I did with Abhinandan Sekri and say that 
I felt so much like I'm sitting with two friends in a living room talking to them that at one point I interrupted <laughs> before I realized I wasn't there. <laughs> and to me, this is like fucking special. I don't want to reach a million people if I can touch ten people in this way, mm. right? right? It's 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 precious for that reason. Right. Tell me a little bit about how your relationship with your fans evolved to this point because I'm guessing that like obviously you're not. mainstream like some stars would be and you're not on radio all the time but you know people who are into you are really into you and 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 it's it's not it's not an idolate it's not like idolatry but it's like they're with the person they're with the journey they they're there so tell me a little bit about this yeah well i mean i care about reaching millions of people so i won't say no if that happens and definitely the trajectory of the career all my team around me it's their job to get more and more people <laughs> into my music to to grow the audience to develop the audience so there's definitely a concerted proactive effort to do that but at the same time now that i'm 57 i'm more relaxed about it like I'm just happy I get to do what I do and um I'm happy with what I have. I'm happy with the number of people who listen to me. So, uh you know, there's no there's no um there's no sadness there for me. And uh you're right. Um you know, I you know, when I when I like I definitely think of you that way as well because I'm a fan of your podcast. I you know, your 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 sound, the sound of your voice is in my earphone that's in my ear. And so I definitely feel that closest to you. <laughs> and if I like the art of someone else, then I, you know, I I feel close to them even though I've never met them. And definitely th- there are people who who also f- feel that that way about my music and and you're right, it is fucking awesome. It's amazing. One person comes into my mind. There's there's a lady I forget her name right now, but she lives in Toronto and she's been following she's been coming to all my Toronto concerts for like the last, you know, 20 years. I haven't seen her cuz I haven't done a concert in COVID uh for the last 3 years in Toronto, but before that I would see her at every concert. And I think I was I was living in Toronto and then I moved to New York City when I married Rez and when I came back having been newly married to Rez came back and did my first concert in Toronto uh I remember afterwards she came to me cuz afterwards we used to sign CDs and even if there aren't CDs to sign we we go out and we meet the audience and so she came up to me afterwards and said oh you gained weight <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay. <laughs> and then I remember uh, another moment that she came to me, maybe it was five years ago or six years ago, and she was very upset. And she waited till she was the last person talking to me because I was talking to a lot of people. Then she waited till she would have a good chunk of amount of time to talk to me. And then she really wanted to tell me what had happened in her life. And so she... she was in love with someone also a woman and she said um i've told i told my friend that i love her and she my 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 the person i'm in love with has rejected me and she really wanted to share the sadness with me and it meant a lot to her to be able to share it with me because she's been listening to my music in her ears and even though she doesn't understand any Indian languages she has been connecting with that melody she's been connecting with the emotion with the melancholy that you know I hope my songs have been putting out there and and that was that was that was interesting to me it was really special and I was it made me feel good that You know there's times that I feel like okay I'm not an engineer I'm not building brid- bridges what kind of good am I doing for society am I <laughs> I love the fact that I'm doing music but I am am I helping in society am I helping society in every which way and these songs that I'm doing you know against cultural intolerance and trying to have people get along are they going to really change the world I don't think so you know is my song about muslim marginalization is that going to 
change anyone's mind at all. Like, what good am I doing in, in society? And then a person like that comes along and I can see that my songs have been helping her heal or have been giving her company in her sadness. And that makes me feel like, okay, I, I helped her out. And I think I think she if she, when she hears your new album she'll appreciate your song Har Khayal. Oh, you know, yes. ye nahi ki har khayal tere udasi se jura ho karvi baatein mein karvi baatein mein ras bhi baaki hai to. Yes. This is a, such a beautiful line and such a beautiful moving song. And, and yeah. Ye ye nahi ki har khayal tera udasi se jura ho. Ye nahi ki har khayal tera udasi se jura ho. कड़वी बातों में रस भी बाकी है तो थैंक यू आई मीन यू सेड इट सो मच बेटर देन आई कुड लेट्स प्ले अ लिटिल बिट ऑफ द सॉन्ग सिंस वी आर एट इट एंड गिव अ स्नीक पीक ऑफ व्हाट्स कमिंग अप एंड देन वी विल कंटिन्यू जुड़ा हो ये 
भी बाकी है तो कड़वी बातों में रस भी बाकी है तो so you know let's let's start now with your journey which really fascinates me right you know you're you're born in patna and uh, uh, you grow up a little bit in delhi and then at the age of 9 you you kind of uprooted or whatever you, you know you go to toronto and it's, it's it's sort of a different life what do you remember about those early years like what were your parents like what kind of music did you listen to at home you know what was the vibe yep i was born in patna so my family is from delhi My my dad was born and I'm going into this detail just because I'm familiar with your format. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, so, and so I know that you know your guests go into this kind of detail and I love it. So uh my my dad was born in Rawalpindi and my mom was born in Lahore and they both lived through partition came over to the India side after partition. So they 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 saw that violent violent turbulent time uh in our shared Pakistani Indian history and my mom's family is from Delhi and that's really where i mostly you know i associate with delhi most as home in india uh, even though i lived in bombay for many 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 years and had that about as well but i call you know delhi home in in india and so uh but my dad happened to be working uh he's he's a microbiologist or uh and he was working in patna at the time and that's when i happened to pop out um in patna and then right after i was born he got uh, a scholarship to do a phd in new zealand so we went to new zealand and the first 5 years of my life were in new zealand and um, the first memories of my life are from new zealand and so the first language really that i learned is english And then at the age of 5 after my dad got his doctorate we came back to Patna again and we lived there for 4 years in Patna and there I went to Notre Dame Academy and it was really really hard to learn Hindi and I remember being separated from the class like the class is sitting down and I have a memory of me being alone on the side of the board and I was being made to practice my Hindi writing and I remember that uh and at that time I I remember that there was a feeling of loneliness about that that I'm not with the others but I'm so super glad that I learned Hindi well because that it's never left me matlab main Hindi mein bhi fluent hu so so yeah so that was patna then my my mom and my dad were basically what we call economic refugees in Canada they felt that their prospects my mom was a teacher i also at Notre Dame Academy where i was a student so they felt like their economic prospects here you know they weren't they weren't going to flourish here so that's why they decided to immigrate to canada and i was 9 at the time and once again i i felt like i was the other in canada and it was a really really hard journey to to be the other in this canadian landscape so that was a difficult time and like I when I landed there I was in grade 5 I don't talk about my childhood that much you know the time that I I got to Canada because it's a it's a disturbing and painful time period in my life so I generally don't talk about it right now uh I mean I generally don't talk about it um so that happened and then oh so 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 what I actually I forgot to say is that when I was in Patna That's the first time. Okay, so you asked about music and what kinds of music 
and how music entered my life. So I should rewind a little bit, and I, I would say that the first, the very, very first type of songs I sang were Mother Goose Nursery Rhymes in New Zealand. And I also sang, like, New Zealand kind of folk songs. Like, there's a song called... It's a song that's like the, the words are "I will not marry a farmer's wife," and I, I I forget what it is like I don't know for whatever reason. And then I will not marry a I will not be no I will not be a farmer's wife. I will not be a plumber's wife. And you go through all these like different occupations, saying um, I will not marry like all these kinds of different people. And it's at the children's song. So I sang that, and my my parents have a recording of that. But these are the type of songs I sang in New Zealand and English. And then when we came to Patna, I eventually was listening to radio there because my parents were hobby singers, and they sang ghazal, and they they sang also, you know, mostly ghazal they sang. But there was a lot of music in our household. There were only the three of us. I don't have any other siblings, but there was a lot of music in our household, and so. We listened to the radio, and I sang Bollywood songs. My parents were my first teachers, but I didn't sing ghazal at that point. But I, I also sang, I started to sing Shabad, which are Sikh spiritual songs. So I started to, those are the kind of songs I started to sing. And I would perform Shabad at um, Sikh congregations that would happen every Friday night at different people's homes. So, you know, I guess those were my first performance kind of, kind of things where you do a spiritual song as a child. So that's that was my... Oh, and then I also learned Indian classical music at that time. So I started formally learning Indian classical music and I did the, the, the exams that you do. So I would go and do the, exam, the, the exams that you're supposed to do for Indian classical music and get your little report card or whatever. So then when we came to Canada, my parents sought out a teacher for me to learn Indian classical music with. And I learned at that time from a classical singer named Kalpana Bharat. And so I would go to school and I would learn music part-time. And this continued, this part-time learning of music as a very, very strong, dedicated passion continued all the way through school, all the way through university, all the way through my first job. Um, when I was in university, I my music teacher in Toronto was Narendra Datar. And Narendra uh, who is from Bombay and is a is a is himself like a uh, like a person who who straddles like you know two different types of worlds. He's an accomplished IT engineer and also an amazing amazing classical singer who's got records out and who does does concerts. He's so accomplished. So he's the one who first when he saw my dedication, he said, "Why don't you?" take it to the next level and go to India and be a full-time music student. And so he's the one who put that germ of an idea into my head. And so after university, I I was working for two years in human resources. And, and I did in university, I did my bachelor's in political science and labor relations. And then I was working in, working in human resources for two years. And what was happening in that two years was I was able to see my future really clearly. Like I thought, okay, if I continue on this exact same path, I'm going to go up the corporate ladder and I'm going to become a manager, then maybe an executive vice president, and I'm going to buy a home in the suburbs and I could see the color of the carpeting in my home. And I remember the color that I saw was dusty rose. And when I was able to see that future that, okay, I'm going to get married and whatever, have kids, that scared me. It scared me that I could see that future because at that time I was not ready for that future. And that's what propelled me to, to say, that's not the future I want right now. That's not where I want to go. And another thing happened, a couple of my friends took what they call year offs. So they took a year off 
to do what they wanted to do. One of my friends went to Europe to travel Europe. Another one of my friends went to Japan to teach English in Japan. And so I thought, I was envious of that. I thought, well, I want to do what I want to do for a year as well. And for me, that was coming to India and being a full-time music student. So I made the decision to quit my job and come to India to be a full-time student of music. And I told my mother this, that I'm going to do this. I said, you know, what do you think about this? And we were out in, it was a summer day, and we were out in our in, in our backyard lying down on a blanket. And I was, I was telling her this. I said, you know, this is what I want to do. I want to go to India. I want to quit my job. What do you think? And she said, I think you're stupid. And she got up and she left. <laughs> So after that, there were a lot of arguments and a lot of yelling matches. A lot of doors were slammed. A lot of tears were shed. And my, when my parents realized that I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this with or without their blessing, they finally came on board. And then they helped me prepare for my, for my, my, my trip to India. They, they got me like a 220 volt radio player and a small little TV and like a 220 volt iron. And they just helped me prepare. And I came to Bombay and I didn't know anyone in Bombay. And I started learning with my classical Guruji, Padmatal Walkar. And uh, that year was pure heaven. And then I went back, but I didn't feel like going back to, to, to do a job. So I thought if I study, then... I can that that will allow me more of an opportunity to drag out this studying of music more. If I go back and study something in an academic institution in Toronto, I'll be able to do my music. So then I ended up for that reason getting an MBA in finance. And between those two years of an MBA in finance in Halifax, Nova Scotia at a university called Dalhousie University, I I came back to India for the summer, studied again in Bombay, went back to Dalhousie, did my second year in my MBA. Then I became a bond trader on Bay Street, which is Toronto's Wall Street. I did that. I hated it. And I wasn't any good at it, really. I mean, I found finance fascinating in school. I loved my fan finance teacher, and it was fascinating. But I didn't like... Uh, trading as much. And it was probably because the bank that I ended up with, I didn't like the culture of that specific bank. And it was really, it was, it actually turned out great that I didn't like the culture of that bank because then I, I, you know, two things happened. They were, they kind of pushed me out and I kind of accepted that pushing out and I left. And so then I was out of a job and totally confused and other people by this, so by this time I was doing concerts in the community, in the Indian community, and uh, there were Indian people who knew I sang. So what happened is that uh, this Kathak dancer found out that I'm not working. She hired me to uh, tour with her Kathak, Kathak troupe. So I, I toured with her Kathak troupe uh, for a month in Canada. Uh, and so I did a lot of the, I, like, I did a lot of music with Kathak dancers at that point. Um, I also ended up composing something for a, a violinist, Indian Canadian violinist. And then uh, I ended up going to Japan to visit my friend who decided to go to Japan to teach English. And there in Japan, I ended up auditioning for a Japanese world music record label called King Records. And when I auditioned for that uh, record label, I realized that this wonderful Japanese person who's auditioning me doesn't know anything about Indian music. And so, but he knows, you know, probably about Japanese music. And so that put the idea in my head that I always thought that all this knowledge that I've gained about in, with Indian music isn't marketable in Canada. But maybe I'm wrong about that. Maybe my knowledge of music is marketable and maybe I can work in music in Canada as well. Instead of, instead of being a financial person in Canada, maybe I can work in the cultural industries. So I came back to Toronto 
And I made a list of about 50 organizations that I could get a job in. And the number one on that list was CBC, the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation. And uh, ended up getting an interview with them, ended up being at the right place at the right time. And I got a job at CBC as um, like, you know, uh, as a as a as a trainee in their training program to be an on-air person, to be a producer for music shows. And there, that's where I learned in CBC or started to learn how to market foreign music, for lack of a better word, non-English music, world music, how to market world music to an English-speaking audience. An English and French-speaking audience, because in Canada, the second language is French. So that was a really important step for me to like, I, I remember one day I was, I was programming like two hours in this, this show called Good Morning. I don't know. I think was it called Good Morning Canada. I forget, but it was the morning show. And I remember doing like a Mozart piece. And then I wanted to go to, to a track of African flutes. But when I was programming this, like after the Mozart piece, the and the Mozart the Mozart concerto was um had been played by a contemporary orchestra, like uh, it might have been a Canadian orchestra or a European one, I forget. But it was contemporary tuning, and so when I went to the track of these African flautists, these, these flute players, it didn't sound right. They sounded bad. Like the Mozart piece sounded so sophisticated and ama amazing. And this flute piece from Africa sounded like, oh, what is this? It's so weird. Like the tuning is so weird. So that whole process of thinking, how can I package this music so it can shine? And, you know, I was, I was racking my brain about how can I do this? And so I figured it out that I picked out a classical, a Western classical piece that was played on period instruments. And so basically, for people who don't know, period instruments are instruments, Western instruments, European instruments that exist today that were made in the 1800s. And their tuning is from the 1800s. It's more, for lack of a better word, rustic, and it doesn't correspond to the current contemporary tuning. It's a little bit off to our ears right now. And so from this Mozart piece, I stayed with the classical theme, and I went to these this classical piece played on period instruments where the tuning was just like, you know, a little bit different. It's not bad tuning, it's just different from what we're used to today. And then was able to segue into this uh, piece of African flutes, and they sounded amazing. And so the period piece sounded great because it was connected to the Western instruments, uh, the Western Mozart piece, and the, the African piece sounded great. But that's the kind of stuff I was learning, was how to package world music to, to a, a Western audience. And all of this would help me in my own career how to package my own compositions to a Western audience. So then what happened is about 10 or 15 years of me taking odd jobs in the cultural industry in, in, in Toronto and uh, leaving that, like, you know, I would take a year contract, maybe in a television network, women's television network, and then, uh, or, uh, and then coming back to India and studying Indian music for a year. So this kind of bouncing back and forth happened. And then, so I was going first to Bombay to learn classical music. And then I was learning classical music to to not be a classical Indian singer, but to be just a better singer of whatever I wanted to sing, to get that kind of command in my throat, in my voice. Then I also wanted to compose, and, you know, Ghazal was a love of mine, and I discovered Vittal Rao, who was a legendary musician that nobody knew about. I was lucky to discover him in Hyderabad, and I went to learn with him, not knowing anyone in Hyderabad either, and uh, that's where I started to learn a ghazal, but more importantly, composition, because he was a brilliant composer. And so that's where I learned my art of composing. Then, went, you know, 
Uh, my last full-time job in the Western world was at a, a, a record label called Putumaya World Music, which is which was at that time North America's largest world music, an independent world music record label. And so I, I worked with them for two years. And once again, our entire company of 40 people was geared towards packaging world music to a Western audience. So there I learned a lot as well. Uh, and all of this helped me in my own career. So then the la at first I was working at, with Putumayo in New York City. Then I went to work with them in their touring office in San Francisco. Lo and behold, they, they shut down their San Francisco office. So I was out, I was out of a job and I was pretty depressed. And by this time, my parents, uh, they were the ones who convinced me to come back to Toronto and to, to release my first album because I was sitting on a grant from the Canada Council for the Arts and I hadn't fulfilled the grant to make an album. And so I thought, okay, this time, instead of, you know, when I don't have a job, I usually just, you know, pack my bags and go to India. This time around, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to stay in Toronto and I'm going to make an album. So I did that. And then that's where I ended up after that getting a manager, manager and an agent. And basically, you know, haven't looked back for the last 23, 23 years, eight albums later, I've uh, been doing music. Been, I've been lucky enough to do music. What I kind of find fascinating about this is right from this early start, it's almost as if you are on two parallel journeys. And one journey is just that journey of finding yourself as a musician and refining yourself as a musician. And the other journey is a journey of figuring out how the music that you then make can be marketed to people and all of that. And you're getting that professional experience as well. Uh, for the moment, let me sort of double click on that journey as a musician. And, you know, you've spoken about how, you know, you became familiar with Punjabi music, there was, you know, a poet friend of your mother invited you to this uh, recital of various poets and the organization was called Punjabi Kalma, the Kafila Caravan of Punjabi Poets. And you mentioned how you were kind of blown away by this. And you also speak about how later in time you kind of went into Punjab, you traveled through villages, you were trying to find musicians who'd never been recorded and you were trying to get away from the kind of Punjabi music you typically hear in the club scene and the Bhangra and all of that and just trying to, you know, get to the roots of it. So tell me a bit about this musical journey. Like also you mentioned, you know, that you spoke about how that first year in Bombay with Padma Talwalkar was pure heaven. And, 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 and I, I want to dig into that phrase as well. Like, why was it pure heaven? You know, what was happening? What was uh, mm. going on in there? So take me through your various journeys of, you know, discovering these different types of music, maybe Hindustani classical with Padma Talwalkar and otherwise discovering Punjabi music, discovering the ghazal, you know, all of these separate um, forms, what they meant to you and how you got into that. To answer your question, why was it heaven? When I was in Bombay learning with Padma Talwalkar, I can answer that with one word. And that word is sur, which to people who don't know Hindustani is pitch or note. And it was the discovery of of pitch that was that was so pure, pure pitch that was just just heaven. So what had happened is that. My Toronto teacher, Narendra Datar, is the person who first said, why don't you quit your job and go to India and be a full-time student? He himself quit his job at that time to come to India, to stay in India for a year for the dual purposes of doing music and to find a wife. <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you know, this is a perfect time for you to come because I'm here. So I landed, and may maybe in, maybe I said it in an, in an earlier part of this inter interview. Maybe I said I didn't know anyone in Bombay, and I take that back. I Narendra was there for me in Bombay. So so I quit my job. I land in Bombay, and you know I'm staying at my my Masi's apartment in Juhu, and. Narendra and I had made a short list of people that I would like to learn from. Maestros. I mean, Narendra himself is an accomplished musician, but he himself suggested 
go to a different person for a year and learn something else. You'll always, I'll be here for you to learn from, but just go to another maestro um, who doesn't have a day job as an engineer and, you know, they just do this day and night and learn something else. So we'd made a short list and on the top of that list was someone I who, who, who I won't name right now, but I had written to her she was she was fluent in English and was educated in the normal what we call you know normal English academic way, and she was a maestro a musician as well in the Indian classical scene. And I had written to her from Toronto, and she'd written back to me, and I had found a connection with her. Super excited to to meet her and learn with her. When I landed here and I went to my first couple of lessons with her, it didn't click. I hadn't landed. You know, so I went, I went, uh, I, w I used to have lunch with Narendra, with his family, with his mom and his dad and him, who were my second family in Bombay for a while. And, you know, I was telling him that I'm unhappy with it. I'm not getting what I want. I wanted to learn in the Guru Shishya Parampara method. And for those who don't know what the Guru Shishya Parampara process is, it's a process in which you kind of devote yourself entirely as a student to your teacher, your guru, and your guru passes down their knowledge to you. And it's not like come nine to 10 and this is your one hour lesson. It is a way of life. And you sit with the guruji for hours and hours. And you... You, you have to basically enter an insane schedule and you have to give up socialization. You have to give up a normal way. You have to be a monk for music, basically. That's what I was looking for. And I was aware that maybe this type of of learning doesn't exist anymore. After here, he, after all, here I am in Canada. Maybe I'm exoticizing. I hope I said that word correctly. Exoticizing Indian music learning, thinking that oh, okay, they used to learn this way, and I'm oh, I'm going to land in India, and I'm going to have this Indian authentic way of learning. And maybe it doesn't even exist anymore. So anyhow, we made uh, Narendra and I made another list of who I wanted to learn from. And at the top of that list was Padma Talwalkar. So I was pretty defeated at this point. I thought maybe I've made a mistake coming here. Maybe I was just better off learning with Narendra in Toronto. But whatever, I'm not a person who gives up. So I just went along with it. Narendra made an appointment with the Padma Tai, as I call her. And we went to Goregaon, where, you know, she lives and her uh, music room is and uh when we walked in she was singing i remember shuddh kalyan at that time and we walked in and she was singing that and we were at the door and she there was she, there was her and a tabla player there was the there were the old, those were the only two people in that small room and she uh gestured to us me and narendra to come and sit down as well so we sat there and we listened to her the moment I entered that room, like her sur was, was her note, her pitch was so pristine. So, so basically, we, you know, there's, there's being in pitch and then there's being out of pitch, right? And you want to be in pitch as a singer. So you spend your entire life being in pitch. So that's one thing. You're in pitch. But that being in pitch is a really wide space. So if you take that pitch, being in pitch, if you take that pitch visually and you put it under a microscope, you will see that the area that constitutes being in pitch is really wide if you look deep into it with a, micros with a sonic microscope. And her pitch was in the center of that microscopic pitch, you know, not a little bit to the right of that 
okay zone, not a little bit to the left, but right in the center. And it just entered my heart. And the second I just was at that, just just not even sitting in the room, I was just at in the doorway, as they say, I was in the doorway. And I just like had this feeling in my heart that I'm in the right place. So she finished her song, sorry, not song, but she finished her, her rendition of that, that rag. And then she, uh, she said, okay, so she gave me a, an exam. She said, uh, I'm going to sing and you repeat after me. And, and I repeated and I didn't get everything, but she said to Narendra, oh God, what is she? I like, she said she was impressed with my focus. And she said, okay, I'll take her on. Because at that time, Padmatal Walker was a very busy touring artist as well. But she took me on, and we I studied with her in that Guru Shishya, Shishya Parampara way. So I would wake up at really early. God, could I forget? Like, I don't know, like, God, was it 6.30 or 7 a.m.? And then I would go to her house and... I would uh, I, I would learn with her, and eventually that morning session eventually became me working with a tabla player in the morning uh, for one hour. Then her other students would come, like three or four other girls would come, my colleagues would come, and I would learn in a group environment for two hours, about two hours. We would learn as a group. Then I would go home at around 12, 12.30 for lunch, and around 3, 3.30... Uh, I would come back in the scorching heat. I would come back and I would be really tired by this time too because it would be really hot. But I would just like, you know, have a coffee and come back. And then there I would I would stay at Padmatai's house from anywhere from 3.30 to, it could be 7, it could be 8, it could be 8.30. And I would do a variety of, a variety of things. She would give me exercises and she would just listen to me doing them. And she would leave the room, but I would be in listening distance, and she would come back if I did something wrong. But it was just hours and hours of my own exercises while she's in listening distance. Then I would learn from her. She would teach me as well. And then I would also listen to her singing with a tabla player as well. So I'd do these these things. And then when I would leave, first all, like, like th- like, th- that, that, that's exactly what I wanted was that type of, of learning. But it took, it took, it took weeks, if not like, you know, a couple of months for my focus to develop, to be, be, for, 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 for it to be that solid that I could focus for that many hours on music. That was one thing. It, it, it took a while for my voice to sing that much, to sing that many hours. So my voice by the end of the, uh, end of the day was hoarse. I could hardly speak. I, you know, I just couldn't even speak by the end of it. And then for my body, like my, my sharir, my body was just so numb from sitting like that. And I remember like in the mornings, I would like, you know, take a shower and I would be all clean and I would watch where I'm stepping. I had landed in the monsoons. So I would be sure not to, you know, step in a puddle and I would make my way to Padmatai's house and I'd be all clean. And then I'd be a little less tired, you know, in the afternoon. But by the time I left her house at 8, 8.30 p.m., I did not care where I was stepping. I could be stepping in a puddle. My feet could be getting dirty. I couldn't care less. I was so exhausted. I just wanted to get to my bed and I wanted to lie down. But I was so incredibly happy that I found her and I found this way of learning. And I just knew that I was going to learn. And she changed my voice. She's the she's the person. Vithal Raoji is is the person responsible for my compositional abilities, and Padma Talwalkar is responsible for the for my voice and the way I sound. It seems to me that there is a very delicate balance you're having to maintain here. That I think all artists have to maintain when they start, if they're being as self aware as they should, and it's a balance between believing be- believing in yourself in your talent and really wanting to do this and at the same time having the self awareness to be able to look at everything that you cannot do to say ki theek hai you know i mean 
implicit in the act of recognition of padma ji's perfect sur is an act of recognition of how far you have to go also right so on on the one hand to get better you have to be critical of yourself but at the same time you also have to believe that you can make this journey right and what is that sort of balance like because you know it's really easy to you know like whenever we get into something for the first time we will suck at it that's just the nature of the beast you know every great writer starts off writing rubbish it, that's that's a game and for a lot of people you can just see that hey i'm not good at this i'm not cut out for this and you can just leave it and that's a danger and the other danger is that you think you're the cat's whiskers you're better than you actually are and therefore you don't need to learn and therefore you don't put in that effort and you don't have that hunger and the perfect balance which you kind of found here is to know that listen i love doing this thing i want to be really good at it i know what i can't do but i know i can learn it and and then going and doing that so how is it like that for you like are there moments where you have sort of the imposter syndrome where you say that you know i can't do this i'm not cut out for this forget it man i have a job let me go back and do this and um you know what is that process uh like for you this delicate balance between being hard on yourself but not so hard that you just give it up yeah well you have basically hit on the thing that creates the civil war inside me <laughs> <laughs> so the guru shishya parampara is an amazing process by which you concentrate so much insanely on acquiring knowledge that you do acquire the knowledge you do acquire an ability and your your abilities shoot up like you know within a year uh you're singing differently and when i landed back in toronto the first thing i i you know my mother said even if it was, you know even though it was nice time get kuch gao sing something because right away she was so curious to hear what my voice sounds like she knew it would be transformed there are also like everything there's there's the good and the bad um and like everything different personalities will react to the good and bad in different ways for me personally the bad part that about about this guru shishya parampara process is that it's super strict and it can be brutal and so you know if when i did not sing the way that but mata i wanted me to sing which is basically in sur or if i didn't repeat exactly what she needed in a thaan like if i'd missed a note out i have had bottle caps thrown at me i have had her throw water on my face i've had her slap my hand <laughs> you know i've had her be like what i consider super mean <laughs> be super mean to me and the reason she can do that is because she will also shower me with love when she was happy with me she you know i still remember she gave me a silver coin because i had stunned her this one time so she gives you so much music for next to to being next to free like the first time i paid her i asked her what she would like for her fee and she said whatever you want so after a month i went home and i gave her uh, a bunch of money and she returned 3 quarters of it back to me and she said ye main paise ke liye nahi kar rahi hu i'm not doing this for money and she said the reason i'm taking even a little bit is because i've already had the experience of where if i don't take any anything then people start to abuse the system so i am going to take something but uh, you don't need to give me that much so here she is you know you're lucky that she's spending all this time with you and giving you all this knowledge and telling you the tricks of the trade and all these shortcuts and so one thing you're indebted to her for that on top of that she will you know love me she will feed me when i'm hungry if i have a problem in life she'll help me with it because i'm alone there cuz you know narendra has left now so she has built the right to be brutal with me that's the way that's the way she's looking at it and that's the way the guru shishya parampara looks at it is that i love you and therefore i have the right to be brutal with you 
as well, because this is tough love. That's what's happening here. From my standpoint of a view, I'm not really built for for that kind of a what's what like I work better with positive reinforcement. And that's what I found more with my Guruji Vitarao. Um but I also realize that people evolve differently with positive reinforcement. That so when I went to study with Victor Rao and he only works with positive reinforcement, I saw that a lot of his students didn't know a lot of the things that I knew. And I knew them because I came from a very disciplined, strict situation in Indian classical music. And I'm saying all this because uh, to, to like I'm saying all this because what would happen for me is that when I went out into the world and I sang something for myself or in front of someone on stage or in a recording, and if I did not like the way I sang it, or if I thought I sang it out of tune or out of pitch, I would hear Padmatai's voice in my my head. So... I, I developed a very strong self-sabotager and it was crippling it, uh, for, for a time being it was crippling me and I, I went into therapy for it and we, we you know we talked about where is this self-sabotager coming from and it was coming from this Guru Shisha Parampara tradition it was also actually coming from my very very first teacher Kalpana Bharat and it's interesting that it came from the two female teachers in my life who were harsher on me because, you know, they were both females and the male teachers were kind to me. I mean, all of the female teachers were kind to me as well, but in different ways. And so I had to really work hard to get rid of that voice, get rid of that proverbial water that is being thrown on my face if I, if I think I haven't done something the way I want to. So therapy helped. Also what helped is I recorded, vi like video recorded a lot of my performances. And I remember this one performance where I thought, oh, well, whatever, you know, I'm, I think I kind of sucked. And I remember that same night I went home and I listened to it. And it's really, really hard to listen to yourself. You know, it's one of my least favorite things to do. It's, it's, it's like, it's such a, it's so awful to listen to yourself. But anyhow, I was listening to myself. And I thought, oh, oh, wow. Like, I was like, I liked it. I liked my voice. I thought that that little murki I took didn't land. It didn't work, and it did work. And so I thought, like, that kind of stuff, taping myself and listening to myself and hearing myself and saying that I remember that I was thinking that I did not do that the way I wanted, but that's not the way it happened. So then I learned to give myself the, the benefit of the doubt. Maybe it happened. Maybe it didn't. We'll go home and we'll see. Um, and then there's like, I, I, I started hanging on to all sorts of different anecdotes. My favorite anecdote is uh, an anecdote about uh, Alara Khaji, who is a, was a maestro tabla player, one of the top, if not the top 10, the top three tabla players in India. Of course, people will differ in their opinions, but that's my opinion. And so someone had told me that uh, Alara Khaji was recording and the recording engine, so, so the record, he was recording something and the recording happened and Alara Kaji Ustadji, you know, left the studio and the sound engineer was going through the recording again and realized that after Alara Ka made it, he did an improv, but he didn't land on the sum, which is the first beat. Because in Indian classical music, you do this improv, you go in all sorts of different places, and then you have to come right back to the first beat of the rhythm. And Alaraka didn't happen to do it this one time. So the sound engineer knew where they were having dinner, and he rushed to that dinner place, and he said to Alaraka Ji, like, this is what's happened. You know, good thing you're still here. Good thing you haven't left. You know, you can come back. I'm at the studio. I'll work overtime. You can come back, and we can overdub it, and you can get it exactly perfect. Okay, you know, you did one extra beat here. And Alaraka said, you know, he's eating and he's very casual. And he said, okay, I did one extra beat. Next time I'll give you one less and we'll call it even. 
<laughs> so I love that. You know, that here's this, there's maestro and he doesn't care about perfection. It's music. It's, it's about making music. It's about the feeling that you felt with his improvisation. And he let go of the technicality of it. Of course, you're only going to be a musician if you're doing it technically correct the majority of the time, but you don't have to hang that, that it doesn't have to be a noose around your neck. You can let go of it. And uh, you can go in different places and you, you don't have to expect perfection from yourself. And if you don't get it, you certainly don't have to beat yourself up. What a fantastic, inspiring lesson. And you know what you said earlier about how when you get something wrong or you thought you got something wrong, you'd hear Padmaji's voice in your head. And it reminded me of an anecdote, I think, about the musician Rubinstein, where Rubinstein said that, and this is a really a Kator Re Bhaji kind of anecdote, where he said that, you know, if I don't practice for one day, I will know. If I don't practice for two days, the critics will know. If I don't practice for three days, the audience will know. And here it seems that Padmaji would know if you didn't practice for one day. Oh, absolutely. Are you still in touch with her? Absolutely. What I... does she think of your music? She has encouraged me. I mean, she has been supportive of my journey to, she has understood from day one that I went to her to not be a classical music, n n not uh, sing classical music on stage, but to sing what I want to sing on stage. She's been very supportive of it. She has come to Canada to live in Toronto in our home. I have been her tour. Like when you do a tour, sometimes there's a tour manager. I've been her tour manager when she's been on tour in America. There's a lot of love there. There's a lot of gratitude I feel for her. I think she's proud of me. She makes me feel like she's proud of me. Uh, you know, Vittal Raji was, of course, very proud of me as well. And, and then, of course, she's going to tell me, you know, but when she hears a, you know, if she wants to hear a video of mine, like if she wants to know what I'm doing, we put on a video of because I do video myself in performances to, to learn from it. Of course, she's going to tell me what I did, you know, where I can improve. And, and I love that because then I remember that and I actually improve. <laughs> So, so it's lovely. I mean, it, you know, we're out of the Guru Shisha Parampara now. Like, I'm not there every single day of my life, six days a week. So I'm out of that bandhan, that kind of cage. So I, I take and welcome her constructive criticism in a completely different way. And uh, uh, it helps me, like, you know, become a better singer. Fabulous. Let's let's take a quick commercial break and after this we'll come back and <coughs> discuss the rest of your journey. But even though I have commercial breaks, I don't have commercials. So why not like play a song by you? So what's your most memorable guzzle from your first album? Oh my God. Okay. So my most, I'm going to say it's one of my first compositions, Avara. And it's a pretty long nazam. It's nine minutes long. And it's apparently written, like the lyrics are written by a uh, distant family member, my mom's Buaji's husband. That's what the family lore says, that he wrote these lyrics. And I picked it up, I loved it, and I composed it and, and sang it. And it's about falling in love with an Avara woman, a woman who maybe is not as dedicated to you as you are to her. And it's a really beautifully sensuous poem. Like he's saying that she comes to him and she offers him the nectar of love from her lips. And she decorates his room with her beauty. And I just loved these words in Urdu. Mujhe jisse muhabbat thi, wo ek awara aurat thi. So these are the words. It took me a year to compose it. It's one of my first compositions. And uh, when I first sang it for Guruji, my Vithal Rao, my Guruji in Hyderabad, when he first heard the recording, he was a little upset. He said, you know, achhi ladkiyan awara aurton ke baare nahi gaati. <laughs> <laughs> but then I sang it for him in concert and he said, Tike, mujhe samaj aagai. 
ये बात ठीक है ब्यूटीफुल <laughs>
Welcome back to the scene and the unseen. I'm chatting with the amazing Kiran Aluwalia, and I want to sort of talk about another interesting aspect of both your music and your life, which you've mentioned, where you've pointed out that one of the reasons you love both Tuareg blues and Ghazal is that they come from a time when there was no hurry, in your words, right? Where it was slow, and you weren't rushing from one place to another. A time before smartphones, a time before ASAP, as you put it, you know. So tell me a little bit about that, in the sense that modern life has very much become a question of always hurrying, always scrolling furiously, or swiping left, swiping right, and that's just the pace of life. And and I think to myself that that often. we need to slow down that too much of everything just goes by in a rush and and therefore you live in a very shallow way it's very hard to immerse yourself deeply into something when you're not slowing time down and just letting it kind of wash over you as it were so have you always been the kind of person who likes to take it slow and easy and therefore the attraction to these kinds of music or do you sometimes especially in these times also find it necessary to be intentional about it to tell yourself that no i got to chill i got to have my me time there's no hurry i don't need to look at the phone well i actually i never articulated that that i like not to my knowledge that i like that the reason i like ghazal and the reason i like tuareg music is because of its slow pace so that's your words i'll send really? you the link okay, yeah well. <laughs> I I guess I I said it so at some interview but that's interesting that uh, I do. I mean, I certainly like fast-paced music as well. I do Punjabi folk songs and I do other kinds of songs that are in a much uh, they're in a faster tempo and are more dancey. Um, I like that too. But in answer to your question that you know have I if I if that's been conscious When I first started out my career, I think when I was in India, like as a full time student, I I took on the pace. It was you know nineteen ninety, nineteen nineties, and India itself was in a in a in a much slower pace than it is right now. So coming from Toronto, it was a slower pace for me, and I totally fit into that. So that was just a natural kind of a thing to do. and then somewhere along the line i don't know when in my career definitely i got i i went along with the with the rest of the world probably when iphones came or not iphones but mobile phones and the internet started and as it started and our attention spans you know collectively started uh, shortening i was on that ride and i did have a realization that you know there's something missing by going that fast and i even wrote a song about it um it's called kuch aur kuch aur chahiye aur kya hai dikhaiye and it's about you know kind of like being at a vendor shop a vendor who's showing you how to live and you're not happy with the way you're living and you're you've gone to the shop to ask for a different style of living And so somewhere along the line I definitely made a conscious effort to slow down. And it's really hard. So for example, if I'm eating and if I say to myself I'm going to eat at 50% slower. That is really hard to do. Um so then I just I say okay, okay 25% slower and then I can, you know, manage that. So I do I do do conscious things to try to live a slower life but also I like it it's it's you know I I enjoy it slower sometimes you have to be fast and you know you're on tour and you've got to grab your next connecting plane otherwise you'll miss it so you got you have to run but yeah I enjoy taking my time so let's go back to your chronological narrative and you know through the time you spent learning from Vithal Rao and there's another account of yours where you've described so beautifully the first time you called him that mm. you know you went into a phone booth and it was noisy and there was rain pouring down all along and you dialed and you spent 3 minutes explaining who you were and why you had come and then at the end he simply asked you the question okay so when are you coming yeah so 
tell me about that journey tell me about him tell me about your love with the guzzel because obviously that's part of whatever is happening so you know you've described so beautifully about how you learned with padma talwalkar and what you learned with her and the, the sort of regimen that you went through and all of that now tell me about vithal rao what was it like with him and what was that journey like right so i was introduced to guzzel by my parents who were were hobby Well, when I say hobby, it kind of diminishes diminishes it. They they had a very serious passion about uh, a ghazal, and they were ghazal singers themselves, or they still are, but they don't sing anymore. And they, when they, you know, didn't know each other, and they were in college in India, uh, in their own colleges, they would uh, compete in in college competitions for ghazal. And so I grew up with ghazal around me, and. you know would go to ghazal concerts with them and they would sing ghazal and i would also sing ghazal and so i was a fan of ghazals from uh from my childhood and in the early 90s that's what you know i thought i wanted to sing was ghazal it later on that i branched out into doing fusion music and 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 doing hybrid modern contemporary indian music so at that time I wanted to be a a better ghazal singer and Vithal Rao was a maestro he was a legend but he was not known in the industry because uh, uh, his students and I we have you know we always have discussions of why wasn't he known and the couple of things one one is that he went to bombay but he didn't stay in bombay and is in, in his time I think people in bombay are the people who got bigger but he came back to hyderabad the other thing is that he was not business minded or marketing minded at all whereas his some of his other contemporaries like gulam ali uh, or mehndi hasan might have been more business and marketing minded guruji vitra was a, a more of a simple man and so maybe for that reason but when i say that he wasn't known and he wasn't known he was known in the industry but but by by people who work in the industry so but he wasn't known in the in the general public of india so he wasn't popular that way but sunil dat celebrated his 50th 50 years of being in the music industry so and there you know, there's a picture of him with a black and white picture of guruji and sunil dat so people who were in the know knew who vitra rao was So he was a hard person for me to discover because he had never recorded in his life when I met him. I discovered him because a student of his came to Toronto and my harmonium player at the time was called to play harmonium with her. Her name was Nirmala. And the compositions she was singing were amazing. and he asked her where have you gotten these compositions from and she said my guruji vitra rao so then i hadn't gone to that concert but i called her to my my house and i spoke with her and hadn't heard a you know vitra rao's voice but heard the compositions that she sang and the no doubt the compositions were stunning and so i said i have to go meet this person i have to go learn how he made these compositions And so I came to Bombay cuz uh that's where I would you know uh you know I was still learning from Padmatai you know on an ongoing basis and I thought okay this week I'm going to tell Padmatai that I'm going to go to Hyderabad and learn ghazal now and uh I didn't have the guts cuz remember it was a very strict and you know brutal system of learning <laughs> and and kind of you know in the classical world non classical music is frowned upon and so i was afraid to tell her this and it took me 3 months to tell her that i want to go to hyderabad and learn but you know after 3 months i built up the courage to ask her permission to go and learn ghazal expecting her to get all crazy not not crazy but upset but she didn't get upset and she understood it and she said theek hai jao And so then same day I went to an STD booth cuz we had no mobile phones at that time and it was raining outside and I phoned him and someone else answered the phone I think his his son Chantanu and then I finally got him on the phone and I explained to him who I am I've been learning 
for so long and I've come and this is how I found out about him and I think his compositions are stunning and then you know finally said and I and I want to come learn from you matlab main aap se seekhna seekhne ke liye aana chahti hu and all he said was to aao na you know which means so then come why not and yeah it was it was it was great and then i went to hyderabad uh managed to through a friend's friend managed to get like a pain like not a pain guest but an empty flat situation where i was staying didn't know a single soul in hyderabad and understood how to get to his house which is an old hyderabad gosha mahal and and got there and for the first oh actually before this i had uh landed and i had also secured cuz like just private cassettes of his singing so i i knew that his voice was also very commercial and very young sounding and very good so um when i came to meet him he of course wanted me to sing something which i did and 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 it was great i i you know it was it was it was again you know once again i felt like i'd landed when he sang it was a different kind of a uh, of 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 learning from vitor rao so vitor rao was a court musician and what that means is that in hyderabad hyderabad was one of the few areas in india that was not under direct british raj but it was a british protected state and so that means the nizam gave some amount of money or whatever and the and the brits they protected the state with their troops and the nizam was the richest man in on earth at that time and in 1936 the nizam of hyderabad was on the cover of time magazine as the richest man on earth richer than the then king king edward i think and so the nizam had two sons and the second son prince muazzam jashaji used to live in hill fort palace and so so actually first of all should back up now guruji vitthal rao was a radio musician so he sang on the nizam's radio because this is pre 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 independence he sang on the nizam's radio even when he was like 7 years old and so when he sang on the, at the same time the nizam had a very big harem he had like 40 legitimate legal wives and i don't know 300 concubines or something like that so these 40 wives of the nizam they wanted to learn music but because they were from the islamic tradition they and they were royalty they were not allowed to show their face to strange men but they heard guruji with tara as a child at the age of 7 on the nizam's radio and because and he because vitara wasn't a strange man to them he was just a strange boy at the age of 7 it was allowed that he could teach them so he would go and teach the wives music like you know a couple of the wives he would teach tabla a couple of the wives he would teach singing couple of wives harmonium um he was he was more than 7 i think at this time i think it was he was 11 or something but he was very very young so every day a car from the palace nizam's palace would come to guruji's house in a small little alleyway and pick him up and take him to the palace and he would teach the wives and then he would come back and then this continued for a few months until guruji's father find found out what's happening and guruji's father put a stop to this because he felt that his young son might get somehow sexually spoiled by being around 40 women who he thought might be desperate for male attention so <laughs> so guruji has lots of little vignettes like that so then partition happened guruji's older and then guruji lived and the the nizam has two you know his first two sons and his second son prince muazzam jashaji is living in a palace called um hillford palace and in that palace prince shaji who was himself a ghazal a ghazal writer so he would write the poems he would have these nocturnal ghazal mahfils these ghazal parties that would start at 10 pm at night 
And uh, so lots of different ghazal writers would come to these, would be invited to these, uh, and as would be the court musicians. And so at 10 p.m., a dinner, a huge feast would start, and then they would go into another room, and that's where the mehfils would start. And sometimes there would be dance, but sometimes there would be recitation of the ghazal, and Guruji would take a freshly written ghazal and right on the spot compose it and sing it. And he took Prince Shaji's ghazals as well and composed them. And Guruji was uh, invited to basically live in the palace. So he lived in the palace for 12 years. And that's what I mean by saying he was a court musician. So he had all these lovely vignettes. But also, because he was surrounded by royalty, by teaching the, the women of the harem, by taking Prince Shaji's poems and composing them and if you know it didn't quite fit into the meter he would suggest to the prince what words to move around so it would fit into the meter because he was used to dealing with royalty even when he was dealing with us his students he was nothing but sweet he was just pure honey there was no harshness in his teaching so he wasn't going to push me to learn anything the way my classical teacher was going to push me so it was a very different style of learning. It was, and he also, Guru Vitora wasn't so much a teacher as just a plain, plain maestro. So he would just come and into, into the music room and with his harmonium in front of him, and he would just sing. That's it. And it was up to you to figure out how to learn from him and to ask him the questions to figure out, Acha, Guruji, aapne ye aise kya kiya? like, how did you do this? And how did you do that? And, and focus in on something, as you say, double click on something and figure it out. So um, it was a completely different experience and a beautiful one. And you mentioned that, you know, whereas from Padmata, you really learned singing. Mm -hmm. From Guruji, you also learned composing and mm -hmm. how to come. Tell me a little bit about that. Like, were you composing stuff before this? And, you know, what was this whole process like where you learned to compose? What does it even mean to learn to compose? And how did Guruji help you? Like, and, and I'm guessing a lot of it would not be direct instruction, but just creating that kind of enabling ecosystem where you get curious and you get inspired and all of that. So just take me through those days. That's basically really it. I mean, in the West, they have composition courses that you take in, in school. And so you go, you look at other people's compositions and you break them down. You see, what did Mozart do? What techniques did he do here? How did he build suspense and tension and release? And you dissect compositions to figure out how they were made. Or you dissect not just Mozart, but any kind of a jazz composition or really anything, even pop music you can dissect. But the Indian musical tradition of learning music doesn't have anything like that, not to my knowledge anyways. Maybe things have changed and it exists, but to my knowledge, it didn't exist. And there's no such thing as learning to compose in Indian music. And all of us who have figured out how to compose have just done it on our own, have, like, you know, you know, literally like banged our heads on the wall and tried to figure it out and almost go into labor to get that first composition out. Like my first composition, Avada, took pretty much nine months to, to push out of my brain. But then that, that first composition takes so long and you have to just be dedicated to the process and then something clicks in you something clicks and something opens up and another part of a brain of your brain just opens up a little bit and you you can start to use that part of your brain and then you know it it, it becomes easier and so with guruji it was just studying his compositions you know seeing what he did and imbibing it, that that's, you know, that's how. I don't really have a, a more articulate answer than that. <laughs> no, no, that's, that's a great answer. And 
and from this journey take me to your first album like now you go back you start composing you said it took many months to get avara out and to get it done and you know what was that whole period like did you have to fight self doubts did you have to you know think about the kind of music you were doing and why and all of that just you know how did that first album come about because i'm guessing that that must have been your toughest album because it's a first right it's there's so much learning that is happening in there what, what was that like Yeah, it was so when I was working on the first album, at least the compositional part, I was still working at at Putumaya World Music in New York City. And I was actually also being offered a record deal at the same time as an artist. So because I was being offered the record deal, I was motivated to compose something of my own because the record label asked for something of my own as well. because i told them i'm going to sing a couple of ghazals composed by my guruji vitthal rao i'm going to do like a punjabi folk song and they said you know give us a couple of things of your own and so but there wasn't a time limit like they didn't put any time limit on me like i was i was one of the artists they were interested in and whenever i was going to deliver a record they were going to be happy to put it out apparently and so i was working at putumaya world music and so i would work you know the 9 to 5 or 10 to 6 whatever and then i would come home tired and then i would do you know my hour of music and on the weekends i would do more and it was a painful process and you know, a lot of like going back to the drawing board a lot of recording myself and seeing what was done a lot of going back to the drawing board a lot of being really kind of honest like cuz you feel like okay oh, tika you know i just i got this uh one i've got this one couple of sentences figured out composition wise i'm done let's move on but then going back to those and then just seeing does that melody really do justice to the words and if not then having the courage to wipe it all off and clean the you know proverbial drawing board and going back to it so yeah it was but i'm a i mean i i get my relentlessness from my mother she doesn't give up she's a fighter and that's where i you know get my my ability to stay on a train and not get off and so basically i was on that train and i did not get off until i had a finished composition and this another delicate balance i think artists have to face that i want to ask about which is that you know what martin aim is called the war against cliche right and in music i imagine that that is uh you know a constant balance to maintain because on the one hand you're in a form where the convention of the form itself can be a little bit like a cliche i mean there's that thin line between convention and form so on the one hand you want to do something new but on the other hand you're working in a convention which is a convention for a reason and and which forms this kind of a package for all the originality that you put in it so how do you sort of is that something that you know gave you trouble in terms of how do you navigate that that you want to put in something original into this form that has you know survive for all this time like the form of the ghazal in a sense is a particular form it is a particular thing now within that form you have great composers like vithal rao ji you know doing their thing so uh, how do you how do you kind of navigate that because there is always a danger that you know if you keep too much of the of what's there it can you know that it has a danger of lapsing into cliche and at the same time uh, you don't want to go too much outside the form or outside the convention because then you know you might stand the danger of losing the essence of it so how how, how did you manage that right well in the very beginning in my first two albums i wasn't really worried or i wasn't really cognizant of trying to do anything new uh, especially in my first album uh, i just thought that okay i've got a grant i don't have a job so instead of coming to india this year i'm going to do the album and then i'll have an album and so all i wanted to do was put out an album at that time i didn't think that i would be in music full time 23 years or that i would have a career i didn't think anything of it i would just i just thought okay i'll just do an album and i was not concerned about doing anything new myself but the you know at that time the record label had asked 
for something new. So then I ended up with something new. But when, and, and in terms of the form, yeah, you do have to, in Ghazal, you, you, I did have to stick to a form, but I had my own style in that form. And I had my own aesthetic in that, in that form. And my musicians weren't people who do Ghazal day in and day out in Hyderabad. They were people who live in Toronto, who do all kinds of stuff. So there was just an organic, different style of, st of, of doing things. And so uh, there wasn't too much of, of a worry uh, at that time of sticking to the form. And then when I wanted to have outside influences like Tuareg music that I just knew weren't going to work in that form, out of that necessity, I started writing my own lyrics and started, I, then I left the ghazal genre and started to do contemporary music. And that's when I changed the form of what I'm doing. And, and again, I, there weren't any rules. I just, you know, wanted to do something that would be a good mixture. It would be good for that Tuareg uh, sound that I wanted to incorporate and just, you know, went with it. So haven't really worried about form so much. And how did you, st how did you, like uh, a question that a lot of young writers ask me is, how do we find our voice, right? And in a sense, how did you find your voice, not as in voice, voice, but your distinctive style or whatever? Like when I listen to some of your uh, mid-career and later songs, which I'm otherwise familiar with. So for example, Must Must, and we've heard a million versions of it. Or in Sonata, you did Lament, which I first heard in Nusrat's album Night Song with Peter Brook. And that's a great version, but your version is also a great version and it's very different. And both your versions are clearly you, even though the song is an old classic and like so many of the songs you've done are kind of old classics, but you made it your own. You made it of a piece, you know, every one of those is clearly uh, sort of Kiran Alwalia. And at the same time, every one of them is a different Kiran Alwalia, it seems like, you know, that journey is so uh, interesting. So how did you kind of arrive at your voice and how did it evolve? Like, well, did you feel at times that it was a conscious kind of evolution, was there ever any intentionality? Or was it that you could look back on yourself and say, Ki haan, pehle waise tha, abhi aise hai. but at the time, you may not have known, I mean, what is the your sense of your own style? And what is perhaps like that one essential thing that you feel is you, but other things have changed around it? Yeah, I I, so the, to you know, for the students who ask, how do you get your own voice? I, I don't know. I don't know the answer. Uh, I would say people arrive at their own voice in many different ways, seven billion different ways, and I never really set out to like say you know like oh okay now i've got to do it differently it just that's just what came out you know i opened my mouth and that's what came out so so it, it wasn't conscious it just happened and then with the fusion of the tuareg music you know that there, there is no other example of tuareg music is new to the world you know from 10 15 years ago, it's new to the world. So there are not ma very many collaborations that exist. Uh, I was one of the few, the, the few earlier people who collaborated with them. And so there were no blueprints of how to do things. So you can't really go back to anybody else of how they do it. And so you make it up as you go. And my guiding principle is aesthetic. If I like what's happening, then I, uh, then I, uh, then I use it. It doesn't matter to me what rules are being broken or what rules aren't being broken. And, I mean, if you don't use the very same musicians in your band that traditionally are being used by other people, and if you're making your own melodies, then then you're bound to just have your own style. Yeah. And, and 
Tell me about meeting Rez and the influence he had because, I mean, obviously there'd be that personal influence and the journey that your life takes and all of that. But equally, I'm guessing there would be a very strong musical influence because from the time he starts playing with you, there is this jazz slash blues influence that also comes in that seems to be grounding a lot of the work that you're doing. So tell me about both these aspects, the personal aspect and, you know, the musical aspect because like every morning you wake up and there's a musician with you, you know, <laughs> which is such a... <laughs> Yeah. Well, if you had Rez here with me, then you would get two different stories of how, you know, we met. But it's just me here right now, so you're going to get my version. I'll just point out for my listeners that uh, when uh, Kiran and I were corresponding, I said that I hope Rez is coming with you. I'd love to have both of you on the show. But Rez sadly uh, didn't even apply for the visa because Pakistani origin and getting a visa here is tough and it's just it's it's a messed up situation but inshallah maybe someday we can do that as well but go ahead yeah and then he'll give you his version so I met Raz because so okay so I I spoke about you know at CBC radio and at Pudumaya World Music the record label in both of those places I was learning how to package music that isn't in English to an audience that speaks in English. Packaging world music to an English-speaking audience. And so when I was ready to do my own album, and I was, as, you know, I was working on that album as I was working in Putumayo, I was thinking about what my band, what, what the instrumentation of my band is going to be. And I was contemplating either flute, bansuri, or guitar. And a lot of people think that, uh, oh, ghazal and guitar, because remember that first record of mine was still ghazal. They think that, uh, you know, there's no there's no guitar in ghazal, but actually there is. Jagjit Singh used a guitarist, you know, Chintu Singh and Deepak Khajanchi were his two guitarists. And uh, Gulam Ali also used a guitarist. I forget if Mandy Hassan did or not. So these are people that in Toronto I would see in concert. I would literally see the guitarists. But when you heard their albums and even in concert, the guitar was mixed very low. So you had to be listening for it to hear it. But they they used the guitar, so it was there. I knew it existed for me as a possibility. And I basically picked the guitar I mean, I like, I liked, I loved flute and I loved guitar. I loved them both. So that wasn't, that wasn't a problem. I loved them both. But I picked the guitar because I thought that that would be a window for non-Indians to enter my music. Because there's a lot of guitar in Western music. So for that reason. So then I decided that, okay, I'm going to have a guitar in my band. I'm going to have a tabla player. I'm going to have a, a harmonium player. And I want to fill out the bottom end, so I'm going to have a bass player as well. And I could not find the appropriate an appropriate guitarist in Toronto. And I happened to get a concert in the Indian community in London, London, England. And that's, so I went to London, England for the weekend. And that's where I met my first guitarist and, and harmonium player. And they were on my first couple of albums, and I toured with them. But that guitarist, who I'm not going to name, was troublesome for me, you know. It, it was not a good relationship. And so I was looking for a guitarist, and I was advertising in Toronto that I'm looking for a guitarist. And three different people suggested what would later, what later I would find out was Rez. But they didn't tell me the name. They just said, you know, there's a guitarist. He lives in New York City. He might be good for you. And I said, well, what kind of music does he do? And they said jazz. And I said, oh, no, no, no. I don't want a jazz player. <laughs> and then I was at my computer and I was reading reviews of Indian CDs. And I read a review of a CD put out by, by uh, Indian American drummer Sonny Jane. And in that review, they talked about Reza Bassi, the guitarist, and they quoted Reza saying that his father sang ghazal. Even though his father is a cardiologist, he sang ghazal. So I thought, oh, okay, this guitarist knows what ghazal is. He might not have played with it, but he understands what the word is. He knows what it is. Maybe he'll work in my band. 
in my group. So I got a hold of Sunny Jane, whom I did not know at the time, and I, I asked him, you know, can I be connected with Reza Bossi? And Sunny connected me with Rez, and then I wrote, I wrote Rez a giant email about uh, asking him if he would be interested in playing in my music. And I'm living in Toronto, and Rez is living in New York City, which by plane are only an hour away, so it's doable for bigger concerts. And he wrote back, and he kind of ignored my request, and said that I, I went to your website and I really like your voice and I'm doing an album and would you be like to be would you like to be part of my album? And I kind of just rolled my eyes because I thought, okay, he's not interested in playing with my music. And I just said, okay, yes, sure, I'll be on your album. But you know, later on we talked on the phone and uh, he just kind of forgotten to answer that part of my question and he was going to be very much into playing my music so the first time we spoke on the phone there were already uh, romantic sparks uh, like i knew that there was something there but i love the courting process so I, I i love the process in which you're courting and you you know you don't quite know where things are going that's the juiciest part of the relationship for me most exciting part and so the next month I was coming to New York City for a concert. And so we, we, we planned to meet then at the concert and it's 8 p.m. It's concert time and my agent is telling me to start. But I didn't want to start because Rez wasn't there and I knew he would come to the concert. I just knew that. But he wasn't there then. 8.01 p.m. He walks in with Sonny and sits there. And the second I saw him, I thought, I can't wait to hug him. And so we got through the concert and afterwards I invited him backstage and we had a wonderful evening. The whole my whole group and Sunny and Rez, we went out for dinner and and um we sh we all shared like different kinds of drinks. Like we'd order a drink and we would all take a sip each. It was just like one of those wonderful magical evenings. And I'm telling you the romantic side, not the musical side yet, just because it's, I don't know, it's just... Like, I like the romantic oh, side. Nice. Let's continue and then we'll come to the music <laughs> okay, later. Okay, right. Yeah. So then my harmonium player at that time, Ashok Bidet, who passed away later, at that time he wanted to see Times Square. So we all went to Times Square and we went into one of those, you know, fancy five-star hotels with a beautiful view of Times Square and ordered more drinks. Um, and... Just had a lovely time and it was really late by this time you know and we're where we come down and it's time for now to us finally to part company with rez you know my band is gonna walk to our hotel and rez is gonna go to his home because he lives in new york city and my band was was uh, in front of me so we're walking and my 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 band is walking in front of me and i'm with rez and he has you know we've said our goodbyes and he's turned around and he's gotten a cab and i'm looking at him and he's i'm looking at him as he gets in the cab and the new york taxi driver he saw me through the open door uh looking at rez and once rez sat in the cab the cab driver said to him she doesn't want you to leave <laughs> And so that's interesting that it was in my eyes and in my demeanor that, you know, that that I didn't want him to leave. And so it was lovely. So that's how we basically met. And then he came to Toronto. And yeah, so as we chatted on the phone, it still wasn't clear to him that, you know, things were gonna get romantic but in my mind i knew that there's a spark there and so we talked about working on his album and he was going to come to toronto and we were going to rehearse his music and then he said if i come to toronto will you introduce me to your parents which is a pretty like it's a it's pretty early in the relationship we're not even boyfriend girlfriend and you are asking to be introduced to my parents already but I understood it. I was we weren't young anymore. We weren't in our twenties. I think I was like thirty-six or something, maybe thirty-seven, I forget. But you know, like mid thirties. So I understood that he doesn't want to waste his time with me if I'm not serious. And also, he was a person born in Pakistan. And even though he does not identify 
with religion at all, with any kind of religion at all, that is his, you know, that's his, that's where he, he grew up in that, in an Islamic household, not a religious household, but still, you know, comes from an Islamic country. And uh, my parents are, you know, I was born in India, they were born in India, we're Sikh, that's our religion. And so there, you know, there could be possible hurdles caused by my parents, maybe. And so he just wanted to get that out in the open. Like, what kind of a ride is this going to be? Is this going to be a roller coaster? Or is this going to be a smooth ride? So that's why he said that, will you introduce me to my to your parents? And I said, sure, I will. Uh, even though, you know, I, I hate for my parents to be involved in my personal life, but I understood where he's coming from. So he came, introduced him to my parents, and we became, you know, intimately involved in that in that first visit of his to Toronto. Worked on the music, and became boyfriend girlfriend, and there was no Bollywood drama in by either parents, not his parents or not mine. Even though both sets of parents lived through partition and saw bloodshed and physical and sexual violence, witnessed it. They understood that hatred of that kind that they have seen and witnessed just cannot be allowed to surface. And even though my parents had lived through partition, they never, they never passed down any hatred to me of the other side. And his parents never passed any hatred for India down to him. So Rez and I never grew up with any kind of hatred to, for the opposite side. In fact, before I re met Rez, like three months before I met Rez, I had actually gone to Pakistan to do three two, three concerts and had taken my dad back to Rawalpindi to visit his wow. an ancestral home. Um, And we had a wonderful time there. So... That's how we, you know, that's our, that's the romantic side. Now, in, in terms of the musical collaboration, even when I was doing my first two albums, people had approached me by saying, you know, it's traditional music and you've got your audience, yes, but you can grow your audience more by making it more Western. And I wasn't ready for it then. And I also didn't have that much trust in the people who were offering to produce it in a more Western way. So both of those things. I wasn't ready and I didn't have trust in them. It was only when I met Rez that I found someone who I, whose aesthetic I trusted. Like, you know, if he was going to suggest something that we can do this and it's going to sound good, uh, I trusted it. And also with him is when, our, is when my own tastes also did change. I mean, I was already listening to stuff on radio. I was listening to Western music. I had albums of Rush. They're a Canadian band. I had rock and roll albums. I had disco albums, Bee Gees. I was listening to Canadian singer-songwriters, Canadian folk artists. I was listening to all of that. But... I was not at that time interested in incorporating any of those influences into my own music. And so Rez was there, but I, I mean, I wasn't conscious of waiting, but now in hindsight, I realize that it was only when I found Portuguese Fado that I said, okay, let's incorporate this. Only when I found Tuareg music and wanted, wanted to make it mine did I say, I want to work with it. The guzzle format's not working. I do need to bring an electric guitar. That works better. Okay, now I'm, I want to compose a faster beat and the drum kit is actually helping it and it's, you know, aiding the tabla player. So I let that all happen organically. And, and, you know, in res, I had a monster guitarist. I had someone who had studied Western classical music and jazz. So he had brilliantly complex, pleasing, and new, co like, chord kind of harmonic structures for my music. Uh, you know, something that hadn't been done before. It was new to my ears as well, because I'd heard guzzles with chords. But these were different kinds of chords they was putting in. So I was ready for it. He was there to do it. And, you know, he, he he's, he's a key part of bringing a modern Western sensibility into my music when I was ready to bring it in. Yeah, and, and, you know, the space that we are recording in an eerie way, Quarter Note Studios, has actually had 
Rez and Sunny performing right here in the same space where we are sitting with Gaurav producing them, well, Gaurav recording them. I know, so small it's like, world. It's such a small world, it's eerie. And that's such a lovely story about how both your parents, despite having witnessed partition, kind of were cool with it. And it reminds me of something, uh, a story Yogendra Yadav once told, that when Yogendra Yadav was born, his his parents had also his father had also apparently i forget exactly what happened but had witnessed a brutality of partition in a very personal and visceral way and yet uh yogendra yadav's middle name is salim because mm. his father said that we've got to get past it and that's such a you know beautiful sort of story to me before we come back to the music uh, uh, you know going a little bit down the personal route that it strikes me that you know can i say something more sure, about that please when i was studying in mumbai bombay i came across a lot of people that were anti muslim and anti pakistani and my personal analysis of that is that their pain the pain that they are carrying about partition and about what was done to their people to indians in partition i'm going to say was more of an intellectual pain and yeah i'm going to i'm going to leave it that that it was more of an intellectual pain whereas people in punjab because punjab is a state that was literally divided in partition first of all they wit- witnessed it it wasn't that they read it so people in maharashtra read about it and heard about it on radio and read about it in papers and heard about it from other people people in punjab witnessed it and their dukh is more of a pain of the heart it's a breaking of the heart and it's a greater pain which which makes you lose hope in humanity and once you reach that rock bottom losing hope in humanity you realize that that kind of pain is not going to let you live and if you're going to live you've got to get past it and you've got to start building bridges and and to me having been in pakistan having been in maharashtra and heard a lot of you know anti muslim rhetoric and been in punjab and on both sides pakistan india and seeing how the punjabis there's so much love for both sides in punjab for the muslims and and the hindus and the sikhs yeah that's my analysis that because you lived through it you know how bad it is and you know you can't get there you can't go there again that's really interesting i'll take time to process that but i agree with you in one sense about a certain kind of anger being only an intellectual anger because i think a lot of the latent anti muslimness among some people in india is rationalized in other ways that right? oh baba did this or oh there was partition see what happened but those are all rationalizations to justify a bigotry that is already there and that is incredibly ugly and that is finding greater and greater expression in these times uh, i guess and you know i i i talk about this a lot because it left an impact on me i done an episode with anchal malotra who wrote a great book on partition and she pointed out that at one point she was uh, in lahore i think or somewhere in pakistan talking to a muslim family about which had crossed through about what it was like for them and and they got lost in their memories and they kept ranting against the hindus and hindus are this hindus mm-hmm. are that and at one point they noticed oh anchal is sitting there and they said lekin tum nahi beti tum theek ho you know and my frame for understanding that is the frame of the concrete and the abstract that in the concrete there was a hindu girl with them and they mm-hmm. were so nice to her and all of that but in the abstract it's easy to build up these sentiments like a lot of what divides us nationalism notions of purity or whatever all of those things uh, civilizational differences a lot of those are abstract notions in the concrete you know there is there is a strain of our culture which is deeply illiberal and intolerant but at the same time there is a strain of our culture which embraces everything you know you look at our food you look at our clothing you look at our language you know where you and i can be confused about should i call it hindi or urdu or hindustani and there because it's one language and and yeah in, in, in you know and i always long for more of that concreteness somehow you know i think every indian who hates pakistanis has never met a pakistani person you know and and which is why i think you know in in uh, outside this country where the diaspora has mingled with each other it's is perhaps different 
but or maybe i'm just thinking aloud maybe that's not even true because so much of the support for the hindu right wing actually comes from nra oh, is so really? yeah yeah a lot of the support for wow them comes from nra is so maybe that's not true either but well i love the way you put that that's a really uh, nice way that, that like you know like that's easy to wrap your brain about ar- around that when you say concrete and the abstract and you you i i agree with you it's the fear of the unknown and that exists for immigrant like anti-immigrant rhetoric out in the west as well i did this uh, traveling festival called love fest in 2018 and i had i took four groups on the road and so it was called love fest a musical response to hate crime because after 9/11 the 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 uh, world trade center um uh, bombing in new york city after 9/11 hate speech and and violent acts against muslims and sikhs rose more than hate crime against any other ethnic minorities in the west so i got two groups from the sikh tradition i got a, a group of sikh ragis that do shabad the shabad kirtan so a traditional group and then myself female led band uh, i'm you know come from the sikh uh, community and i do modern music and then I wanted to get two Muslim groups and I got a a traditional Egyptian uh tanura dancer because I wanted to show dance from in the Islamic religion uh in the Islamic um from the Islamic world and uh, Suad Masi uh, an Algerian singer songwriter. And I did that because I wanted to open doors. I wanted to go into venues and open doors for people who don't come from these traditions. and i want i wanted to open doors to these cultures for them because a lot of the hatred uh, is coming from the fear of the unknown people there may not know immigrants intimately they might not have an immigrant sitting in front of them that they can say i hate immigrants but not you betty so i wanted to build an opportunity where they're coming into a hall and and seeing music and discovering music from a culture that they might be bickering about but you know they can find some connection with it through music but it goes back to your you know me trying to attack that concrete and abstract and trying to bring it into the concrete through music and and this is just one context in which i think about the concrete and the abstract but there is also what we referred to earlier the the rhythms of our everyday life where you can go, go into a cafe and you can find four friends sitting together but they're not really together because they're all looking into the black screen in front of them and you know and they're lost in the abstract while they're there in the concrete with each other and like what an opportunity lost there is to have a conversation you know and 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 yeah and, and so but before i uh, you know move on to the question i was about to ask i just remembered you said a rez's version of the story would have been different so what what, what is his version of the story <laughs> well i'll try my best but hopefully you know he'll come here and tell you himself he will say that he never ignored my question of him being in my group and he will say that he said yes of course i'll be in your group He'll probably say that. <laughs> well, anyway, all, <laughs> all it worked out well. So, a minor misunderstanding at the start is no longer. It, it's a mere anecdote. Now, my next question is about sort of the role of structure in our lives. Like, I think about how the form in which we live our lives affects the people we become and what we do. In the sense that I remember an earlier guest of mine telling me. uh not during the conversation but i think i think it was you know in the lunch break or whatever but something that really struck with me where he said that my job to me is like a temple in the 17th century would have been to a person then and his reason for that was that it gave structure to my life right and he was like if i didn't have my job uh, which forces me to get up in the morning every day and go somewhere and i have a team that i'm responsible for so i have to put in a certain amount of work and that structure is important and similarly there can be someone in the 17th century who is um, sort of um, i mean the world is complex to make sense of it's brutal it's a very different world but that temple or the church or whatever the case might be you know gives a certain structure and it strikes me that when you are when you are in the kind of relationship that you know you enter with res where you know you're eventually married and you're living together and all of that that structure surely impacts 
the, the the way that you think about the world and the way that you think about life and in this case the way that you think about music because you're with a musician and equally the kind of music that he does is also giving you know add uh, giving the possibility of some structure to the kind of music that you want to do you know so tell me a little bit about this change from sort of you know having this new structure in your life and how does it change you and you know you know what are the ways in which it impacts you impacts your creativity all of that well d- definitely we whatever we do makes up so much of our identity and so you know when you lose your job or when you're fired or you quit a lot of your identity is gone so yeah you were very so closely tied to what we do for a living i wouldn't have been i wouldn't have continued as a full-time musician if it wasn't for res because it it was really hard to tour with the group that i was touring with for the first couple of years of my life it was very strenuous and they weren't team players and i i couldn't have gone long with that i would have quit it was it was a novelty for the first couple of years but i would have eventually quit but i found res and basically i took home with me everywhere i went you know after the gig you come back to the hotel room and home is right there cuz res is there so he, just the physical act of touring he made possible for me and i kept on touring and then of course with his input and the things that he allowed me to audition cuz i don't like everything that western music has to offer there's lots of possibilities that he brings me that i don't like i'm like okay well that's an interesting chord by itself but i just don't like the way the i don't like where it's taking my melody it's that's not what i'm envisioning so he lets me he's someone because because we are together in so many ways he lets me audition so many possibilities that i want in my music and even without uh, giving them to me he's just playing them a- around the home and i listen to them you know if i was working with a guitarist who i'm not living with i'm only with that guitarist maybe like what 4 hours a week or something i might not hear everything that has that guitarist has to offer but i listen to a large amount of stuff that that res does and so i can pick and choose it's like yeah i can i have so many options and the other thing is that i hum i go around the house humming things there was this one actually ghazal uh, lyrics were written were written by Dennis Isaac and I made the melody it's called Sochka and it's a mishmash of a minor rag and a major rag so it has like two completely different moods in it uh and I as doing that because the song the ghazal is, is half pessimistic and half you know you could say realistic you can't really say optimistic but you can say realistic the ghazal is saying that um be sure to trim the branches of your tree of desires be sure to trim the branches of your tree of desires why because it might become overladen so i mean i don't think i can call that optimistic so i call it realistic <laughs> and so and and so because of these two sides that it was trying to present the ghazal i wanted to have a major minor thing going back and forth with it and i was struggling with this composition and you know i'd left it and a couple of weeks after res said i haven't heard you sing that thing you were singing cuz you know res doesn't speak urdu and i said well which one are you told me and so i said you know i don't, I don't like it it's so esoteric it's so like complex and he's the one who encouraged me to finish it and i did and so many people afterwards have have told me it's their favorite piece and and i like it as well it's, it's it was it was challenging even after i recorded it it took me a good couple of years to have it be second nature to to sing it no matter what's happening in my head so things like that too like he 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 influences me as well when we there's a a song in the new album called dil it's a punjabi folk song but basically he came up with the riff first the guitar riff and he said thing sing that thing you were singing the other day 
And I said, well, what thing? And he's like, I don't know. You were like going like ha hoo ha hoo ha hoo or something. <laughs> and I'm like, what? You mean because that's a Punjabi thing. And he said, yeah. And so that's how that thing happened first. And then I wrote the rest of the lyrics. So we influence each other in, in many ways. Yeah, and Dil is so lovely, so a good time to perhaps play Dil. Sure.
so let's move on and talk you know go back to another aspect that you have mentioned earlier that you thought a lot about that you worked in that you were a practitioner in which is marketing these kinds of music to a western audience right and one would imagine that there also there is another delicate balancing act because you want to market it in a way that appeals to them but at the same time you don't want to a compromise on what the music is or b exoticize it in any way right so what did you what did you learn about the marketing of such music and you know how do you you know bridging that gap and so on and so forth well i chose guitar to be my music as a as a window into my music and that worked M- my career did grow because of that and then basically like i do the kind of uh, after that like after having chosen guitar i didn't really alter my music for marketing purposes i d- i did what i wanted to do i i needed to have like apart from rhythm melody harmonium whatever keys i needed to have another instrument for melody and it was either flute or guitar and uh, guitar one reason was because you know i i did also like it and it was going to be a window but also this part i forgot to mention is where the flute would only play melody the guitar would give me rhythm and melody so that that was another reason why i initially chose guitar but um but there was like you know a small percentage of of marketing involved in choosing the guitar but i just want to say i you know i do love the guitar as well um apart from that i've never really composed in a way or or arranged in a way to appeal to other people i'm i'm actually not referring to your music here because uh-huh. your music obviously is what you want to do and you're just putting it out there i'm referring more to that when you mentioned that in the earlier part of your career you were working in these different places and you learned right. about the marketing of such music to such audiences right. so that's more what i'm asking about in okay. a general sense of how do we how do we build those bridges or what did you learn about that right well that is that has been a challenge so at the beginning of my career what used to happen is that i could either do a concert in the indian community which means it would be in a like a a banquet hall of a hotel where usually indian weddings would happen in toronto so it it would either be there or i could do it in in the mainstream canadian community which would be in a in a hall downtown in toronto and so it would be these two ghettos the non-indian ghetto in downtown toronto and then the indian ghetto in the suburbs of toronto and i would try it was a challenge to mix these two audiences it was a challenge to get the canadian audience to the suburbs well we're all canadian there but to get the non-indian audience out of downtown toronto into the suburbs and to get the suburban indian audience into downtown venues so that was a challenge and i did things like so so the people like you know my my team let's say my manager my agent my 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 uh publicist and the rest of the team around me are not indians and so they already knew how to market me and get me on cbc radio and get me on a whole bunch of other radios and get a print article of me in the toronto star and the globe and mail and so that was pretty much covered but i didn't have anyone to help me market it to the indians and that was a challenge like all i had was my mom and my cousin maybe <laughs> so we would do things like we would make posters that were going to be for the downtown audience but we would also make sure to put them in the india town india bazaar areas in the suburbs i would advertise on the indian radio shows that people would listen to so i would you know pick up the phone and call different uh, associations like you know the indo canadian association of if i have i had a concert in edmonton that would google the indian indo canadian association of edmonton or just really pick up the phone and ask them if they could uh help promote the concert just do a lot of outreach in the community uh savvy presenters who are not indian know to know how to do that themselves in the local community so that if there's um 
a non-Indian presenter in Edmonton and they know that they're having me or another Indian artist there, they will go into the Indian community and build their own relationships to get that happening. So there was just a lot of groundwork we did and proactively went went after making people aware of the concert and then the challenge is that the Indians, because in the early part of my career, they wouldn't come to the downtown concerts. Because if if it's at the CBC, there's a place called the Glenn Gould Studio. They don't know who Glenn Gould is, who was a Canadian pianist, Western classical pianist. They don't think that that venue is theirs. Hamari They don't identify with that venue. And it was a challenge to get them out into these venues. But the, these are the kinds of things that that we did to to try and get them out, and you know we got we got some people out. You know, one of my my current favorite song of yours right now, but it will no doubt change with time. But right now, it's the one I'm going to play on loop is uh, "Zindagi," and uh, mm-hmm. the main line of that "Zindagi umra bhar ka jhagra hai." seems to me and it's very complex and you mean a lot by it but in one particular context it seems really true which is the life of the musician that you know when we think of musicians we uh, you know the survivorship bias kicks in we look at the guys who made it and who become really big and who are still standing and all of that but for most musicians it's a life of str- struggle everything they do is like a la- labor of love there must be so many times where they feel that it's not worth it even you mentioned that you were close to you know giving up you could easily have stopped touring if life had gone in a different direction and i want you to tell me a little bit about the ecosystem for music the uh, the fraternity of musicians as it were because in your time you have obviously known so many musicians and some of them have left and some of them have turned away and are disillusioned some of them must have been so angry and frustrated some of them continue they love doing what they're doing it's all they can do i'm sure you're one of them some of them get a certain degree of success as you have and and obviously the rare person might break through into the mainstream and make it really big but we are i think fast entering an age where the mainstream itself is dissipating and models are changing and you've also been through times where you know perhaps when you started in the late 90s or whatever when you started thinking about a life in music it meant a very different thing you know where touring is a part of it where you bring out albums where you're optimizing for something for something in particular and today it's very different they're streaming out there pressure is put on musicians give me a 15 second hook for tiktok and blah 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 i don't even know if al- albums are a thing a- a- anymore at the same time you know vinyl is making a comeback and there's something interesting happening there and this is a world which is completely unknown to me and unseen to me as it were and kind of befuddling so take me bit take me a bit through your journey as a musician among fellow musicians what is life like for a standard musician and and obviously you'd know about canada and america because that's where you've been but what is what has life been like for your fellow musicians do people fall off do people persevere what is that journey like people do fall off people do leave a bassist in Reza's group uh, got his degree in psychology and so is a part-time psychologist because that was also his love. So we're not unidimensional, right? Music is a musician's love, but they might have another passion as well. So a lot of them pursue a second passion as well. And people find different ways on how to survive. And there's so, so many different ways. There's some people who teach. Teaching can provide a, a really good uh, income for you and stable income. Nowadays, there's the world of sync. Like if you put out a song, you also look for a sync agent out in the West. And what sync is, a sync agent tries to place your music that you've already recorded in to moving image, meaning into a movie, into a documentary, into a, a video game, into a commercial. Wow, I didn't know the I, first time I've heard the term. Yeah, so now there are sync conferences, or there have been for like the last, I don't know, 10 years, and you have sync agents. And then there are people who do music only for sync. 
So they know that sync market so well. They know what's going to sell. And they'll put out music that is really just intended for sync. And maybe uh, music supervisors, as they're called in the West, know them. And they might even like pick up the phone and call them and say, this is what I need for the next film. Can you do it? So there's that too. Now, my chances of getting a sync deal... In, an, in a Hollywood movie are very low, very minuscule. I do happen to have a sync agent only because she's a friend. I met her in Putumayo and I have done music for documentaries, but that that's more original song, original improv I've done within a soundtrack. Not much of my music that I've already recorded has been synced. Rez has more of a chance because his is instrumental. Um, so there's that. The, that avenue one could do is sync and that's supposed to be the new ar because once you get a good sync deal that's how people find out about you they might go see a movie and uh you know your song might p play a prominent role in the movie or in an ad like feist her song was in an apple ad um i think nick drake had a sort of a rediscovery moment where pink moon got played in a, a volkswagen commercial was it? oh wow yeah. there you go yeah so that's supposed to be they say the new ar that if you get a sync deal that can really bring your music uh to the awareness of a lot of people and you're you're therefore you will grow your audience so there's a lot of different ways people can survive for me, I've survived in a number of different ways. Uh, most of it is touring. Well, a lot of it is touring. I also happened to get a few commissions. So um, a couple of years ago, a Kathak dancer commissioned me to compose nine compositions for her. So those kinds of things. Commission stuff for other people. Also collaborations. I've collaborated a lot with electronica musicians. So last year in the pandemic, I was uh, asked to do a collaboration with uh, Canadian electronica artist Echo Deck. So I did that. I've collaborated with Delirium, another big electronica group. I've never really taught for money. Uh, during the pandemic, I taught my my friend's daughter only so that she would have an activity to do. Uh, taught over a Zoom, but I've never really taught for money because I don't think I have anything to teach. Uh, I don't, you know, I, 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 I've learned in bits and pieces like from so many different people and I do something that is kind of unique. It's it's not really, it's not a ghazal, it's not classical, it's just, it's not Bollywood, it's this thing. And so I, don't, I wouldn't know what to teach. A major reason why I have survived uh, are art, arts councils, namely a body known as, as the Canadian Council for the Arts. Um, I have to say touch wood because I don't want to jinx it. <laughs> and they've been a lot, they've been really good supporters of my projects. So that when I was, when I came up with the idea to make this touring festival, Musical Response Against Hate Crime in the Western World, they supported that touring project. And so I, I got funded to tour that because the fees were good. I mean, they had to be good. There were four bands, but they weren't, they st it still wasn't enough money. So, and then for my own tours and my own composing. So there's also other Canadian agencies that have funded me, but the Canada Arts Council is, is, is someone that, you know, without them, I wouldn't have been able to do this life in music. Touchwood, hope it continues. Yeah. As, as, <laughs> is, yeah. What was the sort of, how has the reaction to your music varied across time? Like, you know, I, I guess when Amzameen came out and it's an album that I just absolutely love all of it. Thank uh, you. you know, and I, I guess when that album came out, there must have been sort of a sudden new audience because, hey, one, you're collaborating with Tenari Wen mm -hmm. and, you know, people who are into world music would obviously know of them by then. They, they, they were very big. Your sound also was evolving. It had this, you know, this sort of, there's a jazzy feel to it with Rez doing his stuff and that immediately, I guess, makes it in a sense more accessible to another kind of uh, uh, listener. So what was the reception to your music like? What were the different ways in which people were, you know, responding to it? And how did that continue to evolve in the years since? Mm. So as soon as I started collaborating with people, 
uh, my, my audience grew more and more. So even when I collaborated with Natalie McMaster on the self-titled album, Canadians and Americans, that they love collaboration, especially Canadians. They just love it. They love the mixing of cultures. They love the breaking down of boundaries. And so... And then with the Portuguese fado as well, you know, even world music people like in Europe, if there are radio shows that play world music, I think that they that they really like collaborations. Like they'll play an African track, they'll play a Portuguese track or an Indian track. But when they find that two cultures are mixing, they, there's a sweet spot for people in world music for for that kind of hybridity, a hybrid music. So. With every collaboration, like, you know, my, my audience was growing. Tenari one, it, it grew leaps and bounds because I, I put it out as an independent artist. So I had a distributor, a smaller distributor, which is eventually distributed by a big mainstream distributor. But I got a call from a Japanese distributor that they wanted a uh, hundred CDs. So I saw, I saw that they were very big in the world. Definitely. Yeah. And I think that a lot of Indians became aware of me in India through, through Must Must, through the song I did with Tenariwen because, and in Pakistan too, like I, I got a, an email from someone in Pakistan wanting to buy the album privately because it wasn't available there in Pakistan. And I got emails from people in India as well. Yeah. Yeah, and it kind of, you know, and it's wonderful that people discover you because of a particular song or whatever. But it also makes me a big bit, bit mad because I'm like looking at Spotify right now. And uh, must must the song when it begins the album is got two hundred and ninety six thousand plays, and then uh, th there's a, a, a redux version, however you call that, in the middle, which is about nine and a half thousand, and then right at the end there's a brilliant extended version, uh, which is almost nine minutes, which is thirty five thousand, and Rabaru, which I love so much, has like ten thousand. Zindagi has six thousand, which is shocking. In fact, is the lowest in the whole album. I'm now noticing, which is terrible. So hopefully my listeners will find it in the show notes and kind of do something about it and my next question is also about how you know music like i've written about music i am in fact the only person in the world who's written for both the wall street journal and the rock street journal mm -hmm. the rock street journal was this indian rock magazine uh, which was really big in the 90s which is when i wrote for them and yeah. i think it continued through the 2000s and i realized that it's damn difficult to write about music that when you write about music i feel at some level that when i wrote about it I was almost always winging it unless I focused on what the music meant to me and I could bring that personal element into it because I think there's a tendency that something moves you but you don't have the words for it so you overthink it and you know in fact there's a lyric from Zindagi which uh, you know almost seems uh, to address this where you write kitna mushkil jawab hai tera itna mushkil sawal thori hai you know, which is so beautiful and it almost seems like uh, directed towards me. But, uh -huh. uh, uh, and, and the whole song is incredible. So we're going to play it right after this. But what do you feel about that? That there is on the one hand, a galaxy of music lovers who are responding to your music in a visceral way. And, you know, it makes them feel a particular way. It makes them feel that sense of knowing you. And there's that deep connection and it, it is what it is. But the moment anyone tries to articulate it, I feel that at some fundamental level it fails. Some people come closer than others. But it's 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 like so hard to articulate and sometimes the articulation seems to defeat the very purpose of it. You know, music critics will typically overthink things a lot and they will always try to then place what they are listening to in perspective of something else that they might have heard before, which will always be limited and restricted and, you know, getting absolutely no sense of the body of a, of, of an artist's work and a body of an artist's influences. So what do you feel about that? I mean, that, you know, when you look at the music journalism and the music writing and all of that, that is all around, do you feel that it's somehow disconnected from the music itself that is inherently a, an extremely difficult job as I feel it is? Like, I just feel it's much easier to write about films or books or anything else. But writing about music is just so hard. And sometimes, you know, one is winging it. Yeah, I agree with you. I should point out that the, the lyrics of Zindagi are, are written by an Urdu poet whose name escapes me right now, but it's on my website. And then I wrote 
I wrote, I think he, I took half of his lyrics and I, then I wrote uh, the other half of it myself, as from what I remember about Zindagi. And the bit, the bit I quoted was from his? From his, yeah. Right. Yeah, yeah. And I love those lyrics as well. And in terms of like the, the listens, you know, some songs having more listens, I find that if you make a video of a song, it travels more. It gets shared more on Facebook and social media. And so it travels more. And I've never made a, a video of Rabaru, and it's been on my list of things to do because I have archival footage of myself and uh, Th- T- Terakaft, the Tuareg group, recording it. And so I should just go back and just put a bunch of coll- uh, collage together and just, you know, slam it up on YouTube to have a video. And then maybe it'll travel more. And also having a video ready when the PR happens, that helps a lot as well. A video after the fact uh, doesn't get as many hits. But yeah, yeah, I mean, even when I was working at CBC Radio, It was difficult to talk about music, but I had the benefit that I could, I was on radio and I could play the music as well. And when non-Indian writers, or even if they're Indian, but they're not into music, so people who are, you know, don't really understand Indian music, being Indian or non-Indian, when they write about music, uh, my, my music, I feel like it's more of a description of what it is. And then they ask me mostly about my journey. So, you know, tell me about how you sat around composing this and what happened and, you know, the stories around the journey and the recording process. And it's very few Indians that listen to the lyrics. Like I did during COVID, I did this one interview with someone. He is actually a classical Indian classical musician himself. And he has, I forget what it's called, but like, you know, you have those dedicated audiences that they pay a monthly fee and then you send them information. Um, a newsletter. And it's called something else, just with an R, I think, but I forget. And it was really wonderful because he asked me about my lyrics. So he said, like, you know, what's the meaning of this song? Tell me what that means and tell me what this means. And so that was nice, being asked about the lyrics and, you know, what my motivation was. And where did this come from? Where did that come from? But yeah, it's, it's especially in world music, like in the jazz world, the writers tend to know about jazz. And in the Western classical world, the writers tend to know about Western classical music. A lot of the times they themselves were somehow musicians themselves. And, you know, became critics. So they know the techno- technical words. In my world, where I'm singing in, a, you know, a, another language and they don't know my music, people are at a loss to figure out how to write about the music. And sometimes it gets very hard to get a quote out of an article. Like sometimes the entire article is just a description of what, I'm, what my music is. And I'm like, well, how did it make you feel? <laughs> and um, you know that's the best when when you when a, when a critic talks about how it made them feel. That's what you really want, you know, regardless of you understanding the words or not. I don't understand all of Tenari One's words, but it still made me feel in a certain way. And there's another delicate balance that you've you know handled so well, which is the balance between the two different kinds of music in any song because one is a music of the music and the other is a music of the words and just the words taken on their own will have an inherent music of their own and how do you make you know both go together and all of that which all great songwriters manage to uh, you know do with such ease and even in uh, you know your latest album Har Khayal there is this line you sing Karvi Bato Mein Rasbi Baki Hai To and then you extend that and it's like a magical moment right goosebumps and you know so uh, and it just seemed in this album that there is so much easy communion between the lyrics and the music and everything seems to kind of blend together so well thank you and is this craft something that you had to work at or did it kind of come naturally to you as a lyric writer oh no we work at it and you know hopefully we get it right most of the time So, yeah, we definitely work at it. I mean, Rez and I audition a lot of guitar riffs, guitar rhythms before we settle. Sometimes we'll complete arranging the song, and I'll go back and I'll listen to it a week later, and I won't like it. That's happened a couple of times where we've finished the song, 
you know, definitely two times. We finish the song. I don't like it. We have to forget about it all, let it go. And a couple of months later, come back to it and do, you know, a different approach. So, and, and, you know, you can't really put into words what you don't like about it. But there's just no joy in singing it that way. Because you have to be able to rehearse it a billion times alone. You have to really like where the song has ended up in order to do that. So, and then, then you know, and then I myself have to figure out how to articulate what I don't like so that, you know, we can together come up with something different that we do like. So that happens. And then we are, then we audition the drum rhythm, you know, what kind of a drum rhythm is good. And, you know, we'll rehearse, you know, we'll have a five, six hour rehearsal, we'll go back, we'll listen to the re tape of the, the recording, and we'll see what sounded good. And something that you overlooked in rehearsal, you listen back to it and you think, oh my God, that's it, that's what we need. Or sometimes, you know, you don't find it and you have to go back and you have to you know, keep exploring until you find it. Then we'll see what kind of a tabla rhythm is going to work. Then we then we'll see what kind of a you know accordion pads we need or what we need on the accordion or the keyboard. But so it's a, it's a building process. We build it. Yeah. And and is there a point where you have to discipline yourself to say that okay, we built it enough. This is it. This is fine. And now we'll you know improvise with it when we do it live and all of that. But as far as the actual song is concerned, we are done. Or is there a temptation to just keep going, keep adding, and you have to force yourself to stop? Or do you sometimes just know that, huh, this is done. This is great. Yeah. Don't mess with it. You know, because if it's a drum part that works, you'll feel it. You'll be like, ah, oh, yeah, that's it. You'll just know it. And until that happens, you'll just have this uneasiness in you. Like, oh my God, it's not working. And, you know, then there's this impatience. If you've been working at it a long time, there's an impatience, a frustration. Then you have to calm yourself down. Then you have to say, wait a second, this is the process. Just enjoy the process. Just relax. Let's do something else. Let's talk about it a bit more, you know, go somewhere else with it. But when it happens, when it clicks, it just fits like a piece that, you know, you, you get a jigsaw puzzle and you, you found the piece that fits, then you're not going to look for another piece that fits because that's the piece that makes sense with the entire picture that you're trying to build. Beautiful. Tell me about your new album now. You, I don't think you've revealed the name to me. Uh, have you decided on one? I have. The album's going to be called Comfort Food. Oh, okay. Interesting. And, and the reason why it's going to be called Comfort Food is because a lot of it, well... I think all of it was composed during the COVID years and composing the album was my comfort food. So that's one thing. And also there's a Punjabi folk song that I wrote called Pancake and I sing it with a Punjabi accent. So I sing it Panageka. And so, you know, that correlates well with the comfort food idea. And so I wrote Panageka uh, because there's this uh, trend, there's been this trend that's been happening in Punjabi music, I think probably for the last decade, where they're using English words in Punjabi songs, like they'll use words like swag and bling and Obama and like all sorts of other English words in a Punjabi Bhangra folk song. So I knew I was aware, I was aware that I wanted to do that as well. I wanted to utilize English words in in a Punjabi folk song. And Punjabi folk songs are very much, they're very happy songs, and they're about love, and they're about some aspect of your beloved. And I don't remember how, but I just thought about this, you know, story that I have with Rez. When we were dating, we went to Puerto Vallarta, which is a place in Mexico, and it was an all-inclusive, so there was a buffet breakfast where, you know, buffet, the, the breakfast is included. Uh, you can have as much as you want. And we were eating pancakes, and his pancake was finished, and he looked kind of sad. And so I said to him, well, you can have my pancake. And he said, I love you. <laughs> And that's been a common theme in our marriage. 
where when I offer him food, he instantly says, I love you. <laughs> and so I thought that this kind of thing that happens in our relationship might be a cute thing to, to unfold in a song. And so that's how I made pancake. Pancake khan walea mere valetti multanea, which is basically like saying, you who's the eater and lover of pancakes, my, my multani foreigner, you know, is what I'm saying. Even though he's not multani, he's Sindhi, but, you know, I needed something to rhyme. <laughs> so, you know, for that as well. That also contributed to the title Comfort Food. Yes, lovely. And, and what I loved about the album is that it's actually not all comfort food in the sense that some of it can, you know, make people uncomfortable where you actually address some modern times, Tera Jog and Jane Jahar, two songs you mentioned that you wrote, which are about what is happening in India today and, and, and Tum Dekhoge, of course, which is Hussein's beautiful take on Hum Dekhenge and we'll play it right after this as well. But Tell me a bit about how, and, and, and the, not all the album is like that. Like you said, Pancake and I hope I'm saying it right. You and are. They, and <laughs> You're half Punjabi, so that Punjabi part I am half Punjabi, out. but I'm half Bengali, and Bengalis get all pronunciations wrong. So, <laughs> so Pancake and Dil are like folk songs, and Har Khayal is, you know, about longing and lament and all of that, and it's, it's, it's so beautiful and powerful. But what I noticed even about the political songs or, or, or what have been inspired by the politics of the day is that they are not overtly political in a sense that it doesn't feel forced at all. It's just mm -hmm. really natural, you know, it, it, it's, it's, and that's also a kind of a difficult balance, I guess, because, you know, I, like you mentioned, you heard the episode with Varun Grover and Varun also is deeply political and a great artist. And he points out that the political in your art can never be overt. It might be there in the background. It might be there in the, you know, the sort of ba the backdrop of uh, whatever is happening in your story. But ultimately, the the story is what drives everything forward, and everything else that happens is kind of subliminal. And these are my clumsy words. He, he I, I think he put it much more eloquently. But so, how did the sort of the the, the impetus for this album uh, come about? And uh, and. What do you feel about it when you think of it, you know, vis-a-vis -vis your last album, like I, I, 7 Billion, because I, I just find that this is, in a sense, it's um, it's quite different in some ways, you know, in, in some very good ways that it's just so powerful. And, and, and obviously, like I said, I'm not good at talking about music, so I cannot articulate it. But just in terms of, you know, you being the creator, how had you evolved? What made you think of this album? How did you make, manage that? another delicate balance of politics and art and, you know, in, in those particular songs, just... Right. Well, in the last album, Seven Billion, I did I did do an activist song. It was Hum Gune Gaar Orte, which translates as We Sinful Women. And the lyrics are written by Pakistani Urdu feminist poet Kishwar Naheed. And I wrote the melody for it. And... I mean, I heard that episode with Varun Grover, wonderful episode. I heard it a couple of times. I wonder if he was talking more about film, like like you know, the politics in film cannot be overt. And he I was, was specifically yeah, talking about film. Yeah. yeah. Whereas as I find with lyrics, it can be overt. Like it's like, I'm going to got our thing. It's pretty, it's, it's right there in your face. That if we want any kind of freedom or if we, if we, uh, we as women, if we want, uh, if we do anything to, to fight for gender equality, we will not be seen as freedom fighters for our gender. We will be seen as sinful women. And so it's, it's, it's plain. If that's an activist song and, and it's, it's, you know, it's got words like women who dare to speak out, their tongues have been cut out. That's pretty direct, yeah. right? So that was the first time I think I can say that I did an activist song. And in this album, I I didn't, what, what happened is that, you know, I was studying Hussein Hadri's poem with my friend Krupa, and then I just happened to compose it. And then I realized, oh, like I can make this into a song because 
the way Hussain has written it, it's a nazm. And the way Hamgunagar Orte was written, like these poems don't have an established song format. And the the meter for each line might be different. The rhythm might be different. There's no chorus. You have to figure out what am I going to make the chorus? You know, what's going to be catchy? And it's challenging. But to me, I love that challenge because in that challenge, you discover new ways of composing and doing new things in different ways. So, you know, the Hussein Hadley poem came to me and it became a song. Then when I was studying it more and when I was speaking with Hussein and I heard his five-hour interview with you, somehow I had to do one more song for my album. So what had happened is that I had like because I wanted eight songs in the album because I am going to put it out as a as a CD as well because in Europe apparently they still buy CDs. They um so I I needed eight uh, eight songs and I had my eighth song, but what happened is that when we arranged it, Rez and I arranged it, I wasn't happy with that. So it was a song. It's called Matwale. Uh, it's about someone who only comes to you when they want something, and. I didn't like the arrangement that we came up with, so I wasn't ready to record it, so I wanted to shelve it. And I thought, okay, i got to do another song. And then I thought, you know, why don't I do my own activist song? Why don't I try it? So that's when I wrote Johnny Jaha, and then I sent it to Hussein Hadri. And uh, he was very helpful. He he told me, like, he told me what isn't working. And... So he told me what isn't working and why it's not working. Because this was my first activist song that I was penning the lyrics for. I had composed them in melody, but I'd never penned the lyrics for one. So then he told me what isn't working and why it isn't working, and I changed it. Yeah, and I was what it was. Oh, God. Now I would ha- this was all last year, and I would have to remember what the lyrics were. I don't remember the, the exact lyrics, but... I was kind, my lyrics were insinuating that there's a war between Hindus and Muslims. And my, my, I think I was saying that jo hamare ang hain, hum, do, hum dono, Hindu, Muslim, hum, hum dono ke tukde maidane jang mein hain. Maidane jang is the battlefield. And he must have pointed out there's no war, it's one-sided. There you go. Yeah, that's exactly it. I should have called you as well. Next time I'm going to call you. <laughs> please, please, I'd be honored. Yeah. <laughs> Beautiful. Yeah. Mm. That's exactly uh, it. And he said, you know, there's no war. There's no equal footing. It's a one-sided marginalization. And even though I know those words, I know the word marginalization is the word Somehow it hadn't clicked in my mind that it wasn't a war. And so then I changed it. So I think what I did is, Pale I did, Hum hai ek hi vatan ke. Then I said, Hisse hai ek badan ke. And then when, and, and, and he kind of okayed it as my editor for this. You know, I appointed him as the editor. He did, he did not take on that role. I you know, bothered him up to do that. But then that did not click with me as well, because I just thought that no one who is fighting this whatever, no one that is going through this Hindu-Muslim hatred thing is going to ever think that they're part of the same human body. So that is just not landing. It's not making any sense. So then I changed it to, um, hum hai ek hi vatan ke hisse hai ek zakham ke. Beautiful. And what I mean by zakham is partition. That's the zakham. That's the. So, we are all part of one country. We are part of one. Uh, what would be, what would be, what's a zakham? It would be. Um, wound. Wound. We are a part of the same wound. And in this case, the wound is partition. Lovely, what a, what a subtle change that, you know, makes such a big 
difference and uh, we'll play two or three songs after this and I'll uh, list them in the show notes uh, so you know what is coming up and I'll just encourage everyone of course to go and listen to all of your albums including this one when it's out because you know podcast is not just going to be heard when it's released but even later so and I I, I had such a trip listening to all your music and of course I have my own favorites but everybody will have their own favorites so do listen to everything and particularly listening to it chronologically was like really fascinating for me because it's like the same way that in this conversation you took me on this journey through your life i feel that you know there's a sense of a journey there as well and all of it interesting and all of it so uh, distinctive in its own ways uh, so you know i you- hope i hope that you'll find the words to talk about my music cuz i really need someone who knows the music to write write me a press release for the album that's going to come out <laughs> in september 2023 <laughs> I am not competent or knowledgeable enough about music Hardly. to do that but I will Hardly. at some I will at some point write Hardly. and talk about I will at some point write and talk about uh, what I feel about it which is all I can do I mean mm. that's the only thing I know so can't give gyan on uh, music I'm afraid but before uh, we let you go you've heard enough of my episodes to know how they end and I'm going to ask you for recommendations for me and my listeners of music books films any kind of art at all that means a lot to you and that you're dying to share with all of us Well, I mean, I don't know if I'm dying to share it, but it's but I know that this is I'm dying for you to share it. So. <laughs> I just I know, you know, as an avid listener of the podcast, I know that uh I had to compile a list of my favorites. And so I am going to start with um documentary films. Favorite documentary film of all time is Cities of Sleep or I think it was City of Sleep or maybe it was Cities of Sleep and Cities of Sleep Shakil and Ranjit Yeah City, Cities yeah. of Sleep Cities of Sleep done by Sean Xen who is now getting a lot of accolades with All That Breathes which was also beautiful All That Breathes was absolutely wonderful now there is a film where you know the politics was not overt but it was still there and it was beautiful but cities of sleep oh my god that man the protagonist of that that person in that documentary he lives with me every day he doesn't leave me oh my god he entered my heart another documentary is saving face and a d- disclaimer i i my voice i d- i did record my voice for saving face uh but you can't really hear it so you know don't hear it from my don't see it from my voice cuz i can't really hear myself in that but you know the the music director from Calif- from LA flew down to new york city to record me for it now this documentary saving F- okay i should say cities of sleep first of all is a documentary about people in new delhi who have who are homeless and how they negotiate where they will be allowed to sleep cuz you apparently you just can't sleep anywhere you you know the police will will lucky thing you that you know they'll 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 beat you away from places and and it's really hard if you're homeless to find a place to sleep so that's what that was about it was a beautiful documentary saving face uh which was directed by a uh, pakistani canadian sharmin obaid chinoy and American Daniel Jung won the Oscar for best short uh, documentary but it's it's not really short it's like 50 55 minutes or something and that is about acid attacks on women in Pakistan acid attacks unfortunately on women on their faces happen all over the world this documentary was about them in Pakistan and oh my god oh another one of my favorite documentaries my octopus friend That is a documentary and I don't I don't remember the name of the person. Basically the director is the person who's also in the documentary because he does a lot of scuba diving and he makes a friend that is octopus. That is an octopus in I think South Africa maybe or some part of Africa. Loved that documentary. Uh another documentary is called Metamorphosis. This is a Canadian uh production. It was directed by my friends Nova Ami and Velcro Ripper. and it's about climate change but it doesn't for first of all it's shot beautifully stunning images of vanatu island and uh, different places in the world that they traveled and the documentary goes to different places in the world to talk about how people are 
positively dealing with climate change to combat it. Yeah. So that's another good one. And then uh, lastly, there's a docu documentary called Shooting Indians. And I mean, it's a pun, you know, uh, well, Indians being, it's a Canadian production and it's by Indian Canadian documentary film, award-winning documentary filmmaker, Ali Ghazmi, who's also a friend. And it was, it's about uh, what, you know, Christopher Columbus accidentally called Indians, the indigenous people of the North Americas. And so this about uh, the indigenous people of Canada and about their, you know, about less legacy, you know, about them being shot at. And basically he, he's shooting them because he's shooting a film about them. And it's about their land rights. And I said lastly, but I do have one more, and that's Kafi Nama. I forget the name of the director. It's an Indian production. And I saw it at a film festival, a virtual film festival online, and it was a documentary about Kafi Azmi. Yeah. So that one. Seeing the documentary, Kafi Nama, made me aware of a 1974 black and white film, or maybe it wasn't black and white, it was colored, a film called Garam Hawa, directed by M.S. Satyu. Uh, I really enjoyed that. So that's a movie, I would say. There's a film I discovered called Nan Suk. Oh, sorry, so I should go back and say Garam Hawa is about partition uh, and about uh, basically Muslims saying we're not going to leave India because this is our land as well. That's the conclusion of the film, really. Yeah, but it's really beautifully told. Nansuk is a film about this 18th century painter, and it's done in a beautifully stylized way. I can't tell, I can't, I don't know if that goes in the, in the documentary section or if it goes in the film section. It could, it could go into both sections, Nansuk. I don't know where people will be able to see it, but it happened to be on the website of the, of Museum Reitberg, which, is it in Germany or is it in the Netherlands? I don't know, but I'll give you, I have a link to it that I'll give you a link for. And oh my God, it was so stunning. It was done in just a completely different way. I don't want to describe it too much, but the format of it was so refreshing and so new and so original. Oh my God. It was a new way of telling the story. I loved it. Other films. The Fall is a, an, as an American production by done by Tarsem Singh. Um, it was beautifully shot. A film called Timbuktu, which is a Mauritian French film uh, directed by Abdurrahmane uh, Sisako, Timbuktu. And I also loved the soundtrack of Timbuktu as well. Timbuktu, uh, you know, we all know Timbuktu from that song, Chal Mere Ghore, Timbuktu. And I actually went to Timbuktu and people were like amazed, like, oh my God, there is actually a place that is called Timbuktu for real life. And yes, Timbuktu was a, a very rich kingdom, now is not so rich in the country of Mali in Western Sahara. And uh, and its sister city, which was built just, which was built after it called Timbuktu 3. <laughs> Sorry, I had to, had to. I have one bad joke per episode, as you must be aware. So. <laughs> carry on, carry on. <laughs> so, uh, Tenariwan brought me there and I sang with them in Timbuktu at the uh, Festival au Désert in there. there. That's, so there's a film called Timbuktu and it's absolutely wonderful. There's a Swedish director, um, I'm going to butcher his name, the pronunciation of his name, Ruben Ostland. And uh, the newest film that he's come out with is Triangle of Sadness. Loved it. And before that was The Square, loved both, it. Both of them won the Golden Palm at the Cannes Festival. There think, you go. So. I won't tell people what those are about because uh, you can easily Google those. There's a French film called The Innocents, uh, Les Innocentes, and that, uh, directed by a female director, Anne Fontaine, it's about Polish nuns in World War II and how they were raped and how the nuns dealt with both the rape and the pregnancies that followed. And it's based on a true story and uh, heartbreaking, but very well done, a story well told. Uh, another Swedish fantasy film directed by Ali Abbasi called Border. 
Um, I don't want to talk about that one because that'll give it away. It's best not to Google it. Don't Google it and just watch it and you will find out in the first half an hour if it's for you or not. And I would probably say my all-time favorite film, or at least my top three, is another fel- French film called Le, ha- Le Harisson, which translated is The Hedgehog. And that film is directed by Mona Achache. Uh, and it's about an... I'll tell you what it's about only because you'll find out in the first five minutes. But it, it starts out with an 11-year-old girl on her birthday planning her suicide. And I'll tell you that it's not a depressing film. It's a heartwarming warming film. So there you go. Those are all the films I jotted down in the documentaries last night. Now to books. And you can tell me to stop, by the way. You can say this is like way overboard, Karen. No, I'm just so happy. And I hope you continue going way, 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 way overboard. So please carry on. I'm never telling you to stop. <laughs> oh, God. <laughs> you, you are dedicated to the long form. So books, I have to say... In the recent past, I have not read any books that I will recommend to people, mostly because uh, I've been doing a lot of research. I am making a documentary on my teacher, Vital Rao, and, and I'm researching what courtly life would have been. So I'm reading a lot of books on the British of, uh, on the British Raj and how the Maharajas, what their daily life schedules would have been about. So I've been reading a lot of books on that. Not all of them are well written, but they're information for me. So these are books that I read more than three years ago. Uh, there's a book called A Fraction of the Whole. It's a novel by Australian writer Steve Toltz, and it was nominated for the Man Booker Award, but it was White Tiger that won. And I actually am going to say, All the White Tiger is a wonderful book. My heart would have given it to this book. And the book is about, about how rules can somehow be futile and how breaking them can sometimes be a good route. I'm just going to say that. It's a crazy book. It's chaotic. It's, it's about, it's chaotic. Because, you know, once you break a lot of rules, things are going to get chaotic. But I loved it. I love the chaos in this book. Then there's a book called What is the What? It's an autobiography about um, a Sudanese child refugee who immigrated to the United States under a program for Sudanese, Sudanese immigration called The Lost Boys of Sudan. And even though it's his autobiography, it's written by the American Dave Eggers. And the Sudanese uh, child, well, now an adult, his name is Valentino Ashak Jeng or Deng. And that book, I was on tour when I was reading that book. And I could not get back. I couldn't wait to get back to my hotel so that I could read a few more pages of that book. Even if I had to sleep early to catch another plane, it was such a brilliant book for me. And by the end of it, I wanted to... I don't have children. We don't have, Rez and I don't have children. And I wanted to just adopt a Sudanese child. It just really left an impression on me. Then there is a book that I read a long time ago. It's called Barabbas or Barabbas. I don't know how you would pronounce that name. It's a 1950s novel by Swedish author Par Lagerqvist. And it tells a version of the life of this man, Barabbas who, the Bible says, was a prisoner with Jesus Christ. When the Romans threw Jesus Christ in prison, Barabbas apparently shared the cell with Jesus Christ, and the Romans came and said, one of you will die today, which one? And Jesus said, pick me, or something like that. I'm paraphrasing. I've not read the Bible ever. And the part I love about this book, I don't know if I should give it away, but I don't know, somehow Barabbas has some some sign, some symbol of Christianity around his neck. I forget, you know, what it is exactly. And he's taken to the Roman emperor or the Romans, and the Romans are against Christianity, and they ask him, do you believe in God or whatever? Do you believe? And Barabbas says, I want to believe. Yeah, that to me was like, oh my God, holy shit. That, that that's exactly what I want <laughs> because I have a very like a, a very uh, I have like a 
an off and on relationship with God. Sometimes I believe, sometimes I don't. You know, I have a lot of gusigile with God. And so it really summed it up for me that I want to believe, but I'm not sure I do. Yeah, I feel similarly in the sense that uh, I have an off relationship only with God. <laughs> but there is a hole there and I know nothing will ever fill it. So, yeah, I get that completely. Yeah, the whole the, uh, the whole of never n- knowing the truth in this lifetime. Yeah. Yeah. So I liked that book. It is fictional, but it's based on, you know, a person that apparently did live. In terms of music, Tenariwen uh, whom I love. They've got a lot of music out. I would recommend their albums Aman Iman, which translates as Water is Life. Also, Amasakul, which translates as The Traveler, and also uh, Imi Diwana. It's written Imi Diwan, but I know that it's pronounced Imi Diwana, and that means Companions. Some, I do I do like West African music a lot, and so my list is going to be heavily based on that because people already know uh, Jagjit Singh. They already know Mandy Sangulamali. They already know Bollywood. So uh, perhaps what I can introduce to them is the Malian music that I love. So there's a group called Amadou and Miriam. It's a couple, actually, Amadou and Miriam. And they're blind. They're both blind, and they do wonderful music. I, I don't know which album of theirs I would recommend because I don't really have a favorite album. I have favorite songs. But one album I'm going to throw out is Welcome to Mali. But, you know, people will go out and discover what they want for themselves with their music. There's also Fatumata Diawara. She was on the soundtrack to the film Timbuktu. And her album is called Fatu, the one I recommend. There's a, a wonderful artist from Mali named Khaira Arbi. And her album that I would recommend is uh, Rasul. And then there's a soundtrack for the movie Timbuktu. I would recommend that. And then on the South Asian side, maybe someone that Indians don't know about is someone who uh, post-partition ended up in Pakistan is Tufel Niazi. He sings Punjabi songs, but they're Punjabi songs like you've never heard before. They're full of improvisation uh, and his, 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 just another maestro. Uh, I don't know if he's on Spotify. He might be, but I'm sure you can Google him. I have actual cassettes of his, so I've never heard him online because I just listened to the cassettes. But Tufel Niazi. Then there is my teacher, Vital Rao, who sang ghazals, ghazal. Um, and he never really recorded until maybe the last five years of his life. He put out a recording that didn't really have any distribution. But what you could do is you could Google him and find some recordings of him. And, uh, you know, maybe now that I'm saying this, maybe I should put up some of his music on my website. And, and I'm going to do that in the near future. I'm going to create a tab that says, here's some of my Guruji's music, and put his music up there, just so there's a place for people to know that this man existed and he did this. Wonderful compositions. On the classical Indian side, uh, again, my classical teacher, Padma Talwalkar, whose work is readily available. Um, Another classical person, a male singer, Ulhas Kashalkar, love his work. And then someone I discovered in the pandemic, although he's been around, I don't know why I've never heard of him, discovered him in the, in the pandemic, Venkatesh Kumar. And it was his rendition of Lalit that I just really just brought me a lot of peace. And there you go. Wow. Uh, what I especially love about this list compared to a lot of the other lists in the past, which are also great lists, but this is, uh, you know, you know the kind of language I'm using today. So I'll just say this is the greatest list of all time. And the reason <laughs> this is the greatest list of all time that UNESCO will soon award it the greatest list in the universe ever is that I haven't actually heard most of this stuff or read any of this stuff. And I think Ruben Ostland Square is the only film I've watched out of the ones you named. So I am just so excited to now kind of dig in and explore all of this. But more than that, I'm so happy that I got to got a chance to sit with you and talk to you and to listen to your music. And it's just enriched my life already. So thank you so much. Thank you for doing what you do. You have enriched my life by bringing so many other people into my living room.
ਸਮਾਵੇ ਗੱਲਾਂ ਇਸ਼ਕ ਜਪੀਆਂ ਤਪਾਈਆਂ ਚੁੰਮੀਆਂ ਵਿਲਾਈਆਂ ਹੱਥ ਮੇਰਾ ਫੜ ਕੇ ਗੋਡਿਆਂ ਚ ਗਿਰ ਕੇ ਜਿੰਦੜੀ ਮਿਲਾਈਆਂ ਕੋਈ ਹੋਰ ਨਾ ਦਿਲ ਬਹਿਲਾਈਆਂ ਕੋਈ ਹੋਰ ਨਾ ਦਿਲ ਬਹਿਲਾਈਆਂ ਪੈਰ ਕੇ ਦੁਖਾਨ ਵਾਲੇ ਆਓ ਮੇਰੇ ਵੱਲੇ ਜੀ ਮੁਲਦਾਨਿਆ
If you enjoyed listening to this episode, if you enjoyed listening to all the songs that just played, just head on over to the show notes. All the links are there. Follow her albums, listen to her music, become a fan as I have. You can follow Kiran on Twitter at Kiran Aluwalia. You can follow me on Twitter at Amit Varma, A-M-I-T-V-A-R-M-A. You can browse past episodes of The Scene and the Unseen at sceneunseen.in. Thank you for listening. Did you enjoy this episode of The Scene and the Unseen? If so, would you like to support the production of the show? You can go over to sceneunseen.in slash support and contribute any amount you like to keep this podcast alive and kicking. Thank you.